Hi, and welcome to the SIGGRAPH 2022 course on contact and friction simulation for computer graphics. I'm Sheldon Andrews, an associate professor at the École de Technologie Supérieure in Montreal, Canada. My research interests lie in physics-based animation, but particularly on contact simulation for real-time and interactive computer graphics applications. My name is Kenny Adeben. I'm associate professor at the University of Copenhagen. I do research in computer graphics and simulation. I have special interest in contact simulations in interactive rigid body simulations. Hello, my name is Zachary Ferguson and I'm a PhD student at New York University. My research focuses on physically based simulation and animation. In particular, rigid body dynamics, elastodynamics, and the robust simulation of contacts and collision detection. Contact simulation is a classic problem in physics-based animation. There's a long history of work in computer graphics on this topic spanning several decades. Our main motivation for preparing this course was to provide a learning resource for newcomers to the topic that complements some of the excellent SIGGRAPH courses that have already been developed by other physics-based animation experts. Contact is a complex topic, and truthfully, one could spend dozens of hours presenting material related to contact simulation and graphics and all of its flavors. We decided to focus on fundamental topics that we consider to be essential for understanding the principal challenges, as well as new approaches being proposed each year by graphics researchers. With this edition of the course, we added new material on trending research topics, such as contact for soft bodies, barrier methods, and anisotropic friction. We begin the course with a concise introduction to multibody dynamics, with an emphasis on constraint-based formulations of contact models. This allows us to see the nonlinear nature of the contact problem, as well as linear approximations that are common in computer graphics applications. Then we will take a look at how contacts are generated from object geometry. This section will show how components of the contact models are computed from various shape representations of simulation objects. Specifically, we focus on sign distance fields, which are a popular choice for performing collision detection between objects. However, collision between a wider variety of shapes is covered in the notes. Next, we delve into the numerical methods which may be used to solve the nonlinear and linear complementarity problems that are used to model contact. Ultimately, the goal of these numerical methods is to compute a constraint force or impulse that models the dynamical behavior of fictional contact. There are numerous techniques that have been proposed on this topic, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. A new addition this year is a more in-depth treatment of modeling contact for soft body simulations. Optimization and root finding approaches are covered in this context. And specifically on the topic of the dual form for root finding methods, we weigh in on some of the advantages and disadvantages of the various preconditions that can be used when computing the Delausis operator. Section five of the course introduces an alternative yet increasingly popular approach for modeling contact based on penalty forces and barrier methods. Fundamentals of the incremental potential contact method are presented along with the reformulation of implicit time integration as an optimization problem. Finally, we present methods for simulating contact with anisotropic friction, where friction forces are direction dependent. In addition to this presentation, you will find many more details about the material presented here in the course notes. And these notes comprise more than 160 pages of mathematical details, pragmatic advice, and references about frictional contact simulation. Furthermore, C++ code examples for several of the models and methods we present in the course notes can be found on the course website, which is siggraphcontact.github.io. We intend to regularly revise and update the course notes and programming examples, and the latest version can always be found on the website. With that, let's dive into some essentials of multibody dynamics and see how it may be used as part of a discrete time integration scheme to actually simulate objects with contact. Then we'll introduce constraints since they are fundamental components for many of the contact models we present in the course. Now, multi-body simulation is exactly what it sounds like. You have multiple bodies moving around in space. And these bodies have a position and a mass, but also kinematic and dynamic properties such as acceleration, shown here in blue, and forces, shown here in red. And from a classical me mechanics perspective, their movement is governed by equations and laws that determine the relationship between the acceleration of the bodies and the forces acting on them. 
Specifically, we use Newton's second law, as shown here, to compute the dynamical behavior of bodies. And notice that the mass, acceleration, and forces all depend on time. Now, if we're talking about rigid bodies, the vector u dot here are the generalized accelerations of the bodies, containing both linear and angular quantities. Similarly, for the forces, there will be linear forces and torques acting on the bodies. Whereas for soft bodies, the u dot vector typically just contains the linear accelerations of the nodal coordinates. For instance, the accelerations of the vertices of a tetrahedral mesh. In computer graphics, we are often only interested in determining the dynamical behavior at particular instants in time. For example, whenever an animation frame is being drawn to the screen. So let us drop the T from our dynamics equations and assume that a discrete time stepping scheme is being used to evolve the state of our system. In other words, given the current time instant, we are only interested to compute the state at time t plus h. Euler integration is a popular choice in graphics and animation applications, which uses a linearized version of the dynamics to advance the state at each time step. We can use a first order Taylor expansion of the velocities to approximate the accelerations as a difference of the velocities at the beginning of the time step and at the end of the time step divided by the duration h. This allows us to write the equations of motion using only velocities. And note here that the forces are transformed into impulses, and that we assume a constant mass matrix m, which now appears on both sides of the equation. This velocity level formulation is popular for many simulation frameworks. We further note the use of a special notation here, which is the plus symbol as a superscript. This de denotes a variable or vector whose value is not known until the end of the integration step. In other words, they are implicit. Note that it's trivial to compute the velocities u plus from this new dynamical equation if all the values on the right-hand side are known. In fact, they may be directly computed since the mass matrix is often trivial to invert. However, we'll soon see versions of this system of equations that require us to use a linear or nonlinear solver. However, once the velocities have been computed, we can again make use of an Euler integration scheme to advance the generalized positions, q, and compute their value at the end of the time step, q plus. Note that for rigid bodies, q is a state vector that includes both the linear positions and orientations of bodies. And the orientations are the tricky part here, since there are several representations that we can use. But rotation matrices and quaternions are common in graphics applications. Whereas for soft bodies, where mesh representations are common, the Q vector would contain the vertex positions of the mesh. Now we again employ the workhorse of many simulation engines, the Euler method, to update the generalized positions using the most recent velocities U plus and the time step. Also note that we have the kinematic mapping function H, which defines a mapping between the generalized velocities and instantaneous position changes. This is needed when the dimensions of the generalized positions do not match the velocities. For instance, when quaternions are used to store the orientations for rigid bodies, there is a dimension mismatch. Now let us come back to the velocity level dynamics and consider the forces, or rather impulses, that are being applied to our bodies at each time step. We see the term f appearing on the right-hand side of our dynamical equations. And we could easily lump all forces acting on bodies into this vector. But instead, let's assume that these are only the external forces, such as gravity, that act on bodies. However, we can also add other forces or impulses that model complex and interesting behavior. Let's call these forces Fc. And the reason we call them that is because they can be used to model constraints that couple the movement of bodies. For instance, to implement the ball and socket joint or a hinge. But we can also use these forces to model contact. And this is the beginning of our journey of understanding how to compute contact forces. However, in order to understand how to compute contact forces, we first need a way to formally define how two bodies that might be in contact are interacting. So to this end, we'll introduce something called the gap function, which for all intents and purposes is a scalar value that tells us the amount of separation or penetration between two bodies. For example, in the figure shown here, the gap function would have a value of zero, since the two bodies are exactly touching at a point on their surfaces without any overlap. The point at which the bodies touch is called the contact point. And if we assume that the surfaces of both bodies are is smooth, 
then there will be a direction that is perpendicular to both surfaces, um, which is called the contact normal. Of course, having a point and a perpendicular direction, this defines a plane, which will be helpful for describing the kinematics and dynamics of the bodies during contact. We'll see later on how to actually compute contact points and normals for different types of geometries. But for now, let's just be content to know that they exist. But as it turns out, the contact normal is also the direction in which we want to push in order to maintain a penetration-free configuration of the bodies. So when should contact impulses be applied in order to maintain this penetration-free state? As it turns out, the gap function gives us three distinct cases to consider. First, we have the case already shown on the previous slide, where the bodies are just touching at the surface and the gap function is zero. Let's call this resting contact. Then we have the case where there is a separation between the bodies and the gap function has a positive value in this case. This is appropriately called the state of separation. Finally, there's the case where the bodies not only touch, but there is measurable overlap between their shapes. In this case, the gap function is negative and we call it the state of penetration. And go. So what does this all mean for the contact forces applied to the bodies? Well, consider the proposal that we want to compute a contact force, which is then applied equally and oppositely at the contact point. The role of this force is to push bodies apart and keep them from interpenetrating. Let's as further assume that a scalar value lambda is the magnitude of the pushing force, and assume that we always push in the direction of the normal. So in the case of resting contact, it may or may not be necessary to push the bodies apart. And so lambda will have a positive or zero value in this case. For instance, if one object is resting on another object but not moving, then it may be necessary to apply some force to combat the effects of gravity. Whereas if we have the same scenario with gravity removed, then no push force is necessary. Let's then consider the case of separation, where the gap function is positive. And in this case, there is no need to push since the objects do not touch or overlap and hence lambda is zero. Note that lambda would never become negative here since that would imply that there is an attractive force at the surface that pulls bodies together. And this doesn't model contact, but rather adhesion. Finally, in the case of penetration, the bodies are thoroughly overlapping and thus a positive lambda must be used to push them apart. Note that here the push force can be seen as having a restorative effect with the objective to, put, to move the configuration of the bodies from a state of interpenetration to non-interpenetration. We now have a basic set of rules that tell us when to apply non-interpenetration forces. However, our analysis was done by considering the gap function, which is a position level quantity. And while we can certainly use this to determine, for example, if a collision exists between two bodies, we will need to reformulate our rules about when or when not to push by considering the velocity or rate of change of the gap function. Here, we write this rate of change as phi dot. And since we're talking about velocity to the level dynamics, let's use a lowercase lambda to donate, denote the non-interpenetration impulse that we apply to keep the bodies apart. Um, let's also assume that we have the case where two bodies are just curved just touching at the current time instant, as shown here in the 2D example. Now, if phi dot is zero, this indicates that the relative velocity in the direction of the contact normal is also zero. A small amount of push may be added to ensure that the overlap between the bodies does not, over, does not increase. That is, lambda will be non-negative. Uh, let's next consider the case where phi dot is positive, meaning that the relative velocity at the contact point is positive. And so the bodies are separating, and therefore there is no need to apply an impulse to keep them separate in this case, even though they are touching, uh, because they're just going to naturally separate on their own. Uh, at this point, you may be asking, why isn't the case for phi dot less than zero shown? Well, that's because it would never be allowed to happen. If phi dot is negative, then the non-interpenetration impulse must be increased to avoid having worse interpenetration at the next time step. In other words, lambda will be used to drive phi dot to zero. So given this analysis of the gap function and the non-interpenetration impulses, we observe a, a few things. The first is that phi dot is always greater than or equal to zero. The second is that lambda is similarly non-negative. 
And finally, if phi dot is positive, then lambda must be zero. And if lambda is positive, then phi dot must be zero. These three conditions together are referred to as the complementary, complementarity conditions of contact. Often they are written more succinctly in the form shown here at the bottom of the slide. Um, and in order to have physically valid contact behavior, our model must adhere to these rules. So how do we enforce that phi dot is non-negative? After all, our simulations update the generalized velocities of the rigid bodies or soft bodies and not the velocities of the gap function phi dot. Well, let's assume that a kinematic mapping exists between these two spaces, the body velocities and the contact velocities. This mapping, represented by the matrix J, allows us to transform body velocities into instantaneous changes in the gap function. And the word instantaneous is important here, since this mapping is only valid at the current instant in time. And if the contact location or direction changes, we must update J. Now we can use J to write the, our non-negativity condition in terms of the body velocities. And the matrix J is commonly referred to as the constraint Jacobian matrix, since it is the gradient of the constraint gap function phi. As it turns out, J also encodes the directions in which we want to push to keep bodies from interpenetrating. That is, the direction of our con constraint forces, Fc. We can therefore decompose the constraint impulses as a product of the transposed Jacobian matrix, which gives the direction of the forces and the impulse magnitude lambda. And note that here, the lambda value is implicit, which means that it is unknown. And even though the Jacobian is often computed at the start of the time step, for our purposes, we consider it to be con constant over the time step as well. Um, this now allows us to substitute the constraint impulses with the J transpose lambda term shown here in the equations of motion. And since it involves an unknown quantity, we move it to the left-hand side of the equation. And finally, let's not forget the condition that lambdas must be non-negative. Putting this all together, we now have two equations describing the behavior of the simulation. The first is the dynamical equation of motion of bodies, which includes the constraint forces. Um, and the second is the constraint, kinematic constraint equation that defines the restrictions on the body velocities. Conveniently, this may be rewritten as a linear system, a linear system in matrix form, as shown here on the bottom of the slide. Although note here that we lose the inequality on the kinematic constraint equations for the gap function, but as we will see, this will be handled later by use, using a, an auxiliary variable. And of course, let's not forget lambda is non-negative. Uh, rather than solving for both body, body velocities and constraint impulses, we can form the sure complement of the upper left block and reduce the linear system so that we only need to solve for the constraint impulses lambda. This is a more compact form and is much more convenient for many of the numerical methods we'll see later on, since we only have to deal with one type of variable. And again, lambda is non-negative. However, forming this linear system requires actually computing the constraint Jacobian matrix that maps body velocities to contact space velocities. Um, and it turns out it's fairly easy to determine this mapping. So let's consider how to compute the relative velocity at the point of contact P by using the generalized velocities of two bodies A and B. We can do this by first computing the contact point velocity using the linear and angular, angular velocities of body A, and then the contact point velocity using the same kinematic terms from body B. And finally, we subtract one from the other to obtain the relative velocity of the two bodies at the contact point. And note here that the skew-symmetric matrix is used to compute the cross product term with the moment arm R, which des describes the displacement between the point of contact and the center of mass of the body. Recall that we're only interested in the value of this velocity in the direction that is perpendicular to the contact plane, or in other words, the direction that is parallel to the contact normal. This is easy to compute using the dot product, and voila, we now have a means to compute the gap function uh, rate of change in the direction uh, of the normal. Uh, we can further separate this as the product of a vector and a row matrix, where the column vector represents the generalized velocities of the bodies, and the row matrix is simply the 
the Jacobian of the non-interpenetration constraint. And note here that the Jacobian is, a, is shown for a simple two-body system, but in more complex systems, one of these matrices will be computed for each contact point. And the blocks corresponding to bodies A and B will be inserted at their correct locations so that the product with the velocities in vector U are collect correctly computed. Thus far, we've only seen how to compute constraint forces, or rather impulses, to keep bodies from interpenetrating. However, friction is another contact phenomena that we would like to simulate, and it is the friction force which is responsible for resisting sliding. For example, the friction force between the box and the floor in this example video is responsible for the box eventually slowing down and coming to rest. Recall that for non-interpenetration impulses, the direction is perpendicular to the contact plane. Whereas friction is a dissipative force that works in directions that are tangent to the contact plane. And in order um, to, co to compute these forces, uh, our contact model has to be extended. And, and we do this by introducing two new vectors, the tangent and bitangent vectors, t hat and b hat. And these are basis vectors that span the contact plane. And together with the contact normal n hat, they form the contact frame. Using all three basis vectors, we can once again project the relative velocity of the bodies at the contact point into the contact frame. And this may be written in the form of a matrix vector product that separates the Jacobian, Jacobian matrix from the body velocities. Note that the constraint Jacobian has been extended um, to include two new rows, each one mapping body velocities to the new tangent basis vectors. Also going forward, we'll write the relative velocity which is some, sometimes called the residual velocity in contact space using the vector v. And of course, v can be decomposed into individual scalar components, giving the residual velocity in the normal tangent and bitangent directions. In addition to representing the velocities in the contact frame, constraint impulses may also be generated in each basis direction. For instance, we've already seen how a non-interpenetration impulse, which we now write using the n hat subscript, may be used to push bodies apart. Uh, generating friction impulse forces is also possible by adding two additional lambda coefficients. Together, these form a 2D vector that acts in a sp uh, space that is tangent to the contact plane. And similar to before, we can compute the constraint impulses as a generalized vector by computing the product of the transposed Jacobian matrix with the lambda vector. With the basic framework in place for generating impulses in the contact frame, this next section will take a closer look at the mathematical model used to simulate realistic frictional contact. These models dictate how large friction forces can be found and what directions they may be applied. That is to say, we can't simply generate friction forces willy-nilly. There are some rules. And one of the most widely used models of friction in graphics is Coulomb friction. It's an empirical model based on observations of friction generated between pairs of surfaces for different materials. The Coulomb friction law couples the normal and tangential forces according to the inequality shown here, where the magnitude of friction forces must be equal to or less than the normal force times the friction coefficient mu. Mu here is a single material parameter, but in reality it represents an aggregate effect for a very complex phenomena happening at a microscope scale level between the pairs of surfaces. But let's not get too far off topic. Instead, we observe that the inequality defines a quadratic cone that is centered around the contact normal and parameterized by the friction coefficient. And so as the magnitude of the non-interpenetration impulse grows, so can the friction forces. Note that for this part of the course, we'll assume the case of isotropic Coulomb friction which simply means that the cross section of the cone is a circle and the friction forces behave similarly in all directions of the contact plane. Whereas for anisotropic friction, the shape will be an ellipse or some other convex shape. And the role of friction is to resist relative tangential motion. And depending on the magnitude of the friction forces and whether or not they are limited by Coulomb's law, the objects will either be sliding relative to each other or stationary. That is, we consider two cases when computing friction, st stick and slip. During slip, the bodies are sliding against each other, and so there is some relative motion. Therefore, the residual velocity in the tangent direction, v t hat, is not zero, 
but friction is the antagonist in this story of stick and slip, and it will always act to oppose the tangential velocity. With the direction that maximizes the dissipation of the velocity and the largest magnitude allowed by the friction cone, which is mu times the normal impulse. This means that lambda t hat has a value defined by the limit surface of the cone, and for, furthermore, it has a direction that directly opposes the residual velocity. Conversely, with the case of sticking, there is no tangential velocity. In other words, v t hat is zero. And in this case, the friction forces can have any value so long as they do not exceed the bounds imposed by the friction cone. So we can write the stick-slip behavior more formally by a series of conditions on the relative tangential velocities and the frictional impulses. First, we have the condition based on the friction cone definition, which is that the tangential impulses are bounded by the, friction, uh, the coefficient of friction times the normal impulse magnitude. Next, we have the condition that the product of the tangent velocities and the difference between the friction forces and their bound is zero. Intuitively, this condition says that either one, the tangent velocities are zero and the friction forces are less than their bounded value. In other words, they're inside the cone. Or two, there is some tangential sliding, in which case the friction forces are being bounded by the limit surface of the cone. Finally, we have the condition that if there is some sliding velocity, then the friction force must directly oppose the sliding direction in the contact plane. Um, we further observe uh, that there's some similarity here uh, to the complementarity conditions we introduced earlier for non-interpenetration forces. And in fact, together, these conditions give the nonlinear complementarity model of frictional contact. Also, in this final condition, we note that there's a term that represents the rate of energy dissipation of the friction forces. This notion of energy dissipation gives us some important insight into the nonlinear model and how we might solve it, uh, friction forces. This brings us to the principle of maximum dissipation. And as we've already seen, it states that friction must maximize the rate of energy dissipation. We can therefore write the problem of determining friction forces as a maximization problem. And this, the solution vector gamma is the friction force that maximizes the rate of energy dissipation but remains inside the limit surface defined by the cone. However, downside of this formulation is that a nonlinear solver is needed, such as the Newton type method, in order to compute the friction forces. And this can be expensive. Um, and as an aside, we could alternatively change the sign on the, our formulation and write it as a minimization problem, as we do in the course notes. Rather, in graphics, uh, linear models of frictional contact are preferred. So we'll next consider how to linearize the non-linear non complementarity problem we saw previously in order to obtain the linear complementarity problem or LCP formulation. And this formulation is an approximation of the isotropic friction cone, but will be easier to solve since there are a wide variety of efficient linear solvers available for us to use. Specifically, we're going to examine two different linear models, the polyhedral cone model and the box friction model. And as you can see, both of these are approximations of the quadratic cone. Beginning with the polyhedral cone, we can approximate the limit surface by sampling it in k different tangent directions. So for example, in the cone shown here, there are k equals four unit length tangent vectors. Then together with the contact normal, the quadratic cone is approximated by the li positive linear span of all of these basis vectors. Then the coupling introduced by Coulomb friction can be restated as the condition that the sum of the tangent friction impulses must be less than the friction coefficient mu times the normal impulse. And this condition is written here as an inequality. Furthermore, recall that the cone is approximated by the positive span of the vectors, and so we require that each frictional force and normal impulse force is non-negative. The accuracy of the polyhedral cone approximation can be increased by adding more tangent vectors, as shown here. However, this increases the problem size since there will be more tangent impulses and hence more unknowns in the resulting linear system. Note that we also want symmetry of the tangent vectors, and this is required in order for us to compute friction forces as a non-negative scaling of the basis vectors. Um, in order for the linear cone model to be physically accurate, it must be able to reproduce the stick-slip behavior we previously described. However, now there are k directions in which the relative tangential velocity can be measured, which is shown here as a k-dimensional vector. 
and there is a corresponding number of elements with the tangential impulse vector. One strategy here is to simply define the tangent direction of ma maximum slippage and denoting a variable beta as the maximum slip velocity in any of the tangential, tangential directions, we can then write an equality that must hold. So why is this important? Well, quite simply, when beta becomes positive, we know that our transition from sticking to slipping occurs. And recall that when slipping begins to occur, the direction of the friction force is defined to be the opposite direction of the sliding direction, or the magnitude imposed by the limit surface of the cone. On the other hand, if there is no slipping, then beta must be zero, and therefore vt hat must also be zero. Then the friction force lies strictly on the inside of the cone. Uh, so with these observations in mind, we can write the full set of complementarity conditions for the linear cone model. First, we have the complementarity conditions of the non-interpenetration impulses, and these are the same as before, so there's nothing new here. Next, on the second line, we have the condition that says either there will be tangential sliding and a, a positive beta, in which case the tangential forces directly oppose the sliding motion, or we have the case that there is no slipping, in other words, a sticking contact, and so the tangent forces can have some non-negative value. Let's spend a minute to think about this condition. In the simplest case, the condition implies that only one element of lambda t hat will be non-zero, and this will correspond to the tangent vector that maximizes energy dissipation. In other words, friction forces should be aligned with the tangent direction that opposes sliding. Whereas for uh, the more complex case, we, we have that more than one element of lambda t hat is positive. And this is where the last condition comes in, which couples normal and tangential forces, keeping tangent forces inside the limits of the polyhedral cone. But also the we have this complementarity condition that says that the beta variable um, if the beta variable is non-zero, then the friction forces have the magnitude at the limit mu times lambda n hat. And the last piece of the LCP model is to construct the constraint Jacobians that we can use in the constraint equations of motion. So here we'll construct two separate Jacobians, one for the normal direction and another for the tangent directions. Uh, the non-interpenetration Jacobian is the same as before, whereas for the friction Jacobian, which contains k rows, we have one row for each tangent direction. Finally, we can assemble a global linear system with an arbitrary number of contacts and bodies as shown here, with careful consideration required for the dimensions of each submatrix. We provide additional details about this in the course notes. Um, additionally, note that, the, uh, that we introduced two new matrices here, mu bar and E. Mu bar is, is simply a diagonal matrix of friction coefficients, one for each contact in the system, whereas E is a matrix consisting of a k-dimension all ones vector along the diagonal. And when, when multiplied with the corresponding elements in the lambda sub t hat vector, this effectively computes the sum of the non-negative friction forces for each contact. Um, and let's not forget the complementarity conditions, which are in the end what gives us the correct frictional behavior. Uh, and one more important thing to note here is that the lead matrix A corresponding to the poly polyhedral cone model is, is asymmetric. And this has some consequences with regards to the types of linear solvers that can be applied here. Furthermore, the dimensionality of the problem has increased due to the use of k tangent directions per contact plus the introduction of, in, introduction of the uh, slack variable beta. However, next we'll take a look at the box model, which breaks the coupling of tangent directions and ultimately will result in a symmetric lead matrix with fewer variables. Rather than using a polyhedral cone, which gives an approximate limit surface that is inscribed on the interior of the quadratic cone, we can instead approximate the cone by an axis aligned box in the contact frame that contains the entire cone. With the box model, all impulses are bounded by some upper and lower limit. And this includes both the normal and the tangential impulses. And please note that the limit surface shown, shown here is not quite correct since the tangent part of the surface does actually scale with the normal direction. However, we think this is sufficiently intuitive to present the general idea. Something important to note here is that now there are only two tangent basis vectors compared to k vectors with the polyhedral cone model. This is nice since the problem size is reduced. 
And the Jacobian matrix is also easier to construct, with both normal and tangent directions being combined in a simple three row matrix. This is pretty much the same Jacobian we saw earlier on in the notes. But what we lose here is the coupling between the tangent impulses, since the bounds of each frictional impulse are now enforced independently of the others. And so there's some loss of accuracy with this model. Nevertheless, the box uh, friction model is very popular in many computer graphics applications due to its compactness and efficiency. However, we now have a problem. Lambda must be allowed to take on a negative value, depending on the lower bounds of each specific variable. But the traditional LCP formulation assumes non-negative values for both the lambdas and the residual velocities. However, we can re rewrite the conditions of complementarity by noting that the impulses should always have a value greater than the lower bound and less than the upper bound. And thus, the differences in the, in the inequality shown here must be non-negative. Similarly, we can rewrite the residual velocities as the difference of positive and negative components, V plus and V minus, where both of these components are non-negative. Then this allows us to write three separate LCPs to formulate the box complementarity model. Um, observe that for the first condition, if the impulse has a lower bound, then the residual velocity can be in the positive direction. Whereas with the second condition, if the impulse is limited by the upper bound, then the residual vo velocity must have a negative value. In other words, V minus is positive. I hope this isn't too confusing. Finally, we can assemble a global linear system accounting for all contacts. Note that for the vector of impulses, lambda, and the residual velocities, v, both the normal and tangential components have been combined into a single vector. And let's not forget the box complementarity conditions, which determine the relationship between the impulse bounds of the box and the residual velocities. Furthermore, it's easy to reduce the system using the sure complement trick that we used earlier. And this is the form used by many simulation engines. In this side-by-side -side comparison, we see there are some obvious trade-offs between the polyhedral cone version of the LCP and the boxed LCP model. The former is a more accurate representation of the quadratic cone model, whereas the latter is more compact and easier to solve due to the symmetry of the lead matrix. In the course notes, you will also find some details about the cone complementarity formulation of frictional contact which solves the second order cone problem. Furthermore, we demonstrate how the linear dynamical equations of our contact models may be stabilized in order to avoid penetration artifacts and other constraint errors that may accumulate in the simulation due to our discrete time-stepping scheme. Specifically, a spring damper version of the Baumgart st stabilization is presented along with some tunable parameters for controlling how constraint errors are resolved. Until now, the frictional contact models we have presented mostly assume that simulations involve rigid bodies. However, the same contact models and formulations are also compatible with soft body simulations. So let's take a look at some changes that are necessary to use the LCP formulations with soft body simulations. To get started, we'll review some of the basics of how soft bodies are modeled. And here we'll present only the essentials that are necessary for understanding how frictional contact may be used with these models. For much more in-depth treatment of soft body modeling and dynamics, we recommend the SIGGRAPH courses by Sapakis and Barbic from 2012, as well as the recent course by Kim and Everle in 2020. Soft bodies in computer graphics are typically modeled with meshes with nodes. For example, tetrahedral meshes may be used to model the constitutive dynamics of elastic bodies using the finite element method, but our analysis also applies for mass spring models and even cloth. So we'll assume that our soft body model is a mesh that is comprised of nodes. And in, in the example shown here, the nodes are essentially the vertices of a tetrahedral mesh. We can write the vector of generalized positions as the concatenation of all node positions. And the same is true for the generalized velocities, simply a vector containing the linear velocities of all nodes. Furthermore, unlike rigid bodies, which do not deform, soft body models also keep track of the undeformed state of the mesh. And here we use the vector vertex positions in their undeformed state. Note that the undeformed vertices aren't so important with regards to contact, but they are important for computing elastic forces. Soft body simulations model inter internal elastic and dissipative forces using stiffness and damping terms in the dynamics formulation. At a velocity level, the formulation of the dynamics looks something like the equation shown here. 
Note that K, the stiffness matrix, and B, the damping matrix, appear on the left-hand side of the equation. This is important since they are being combined with the max matrix. It is also important to note that their appearance here implies that elastic and damping forces are being computed in an implicit fashion. Implicit integration is common for many soft body simulations in order to avoid instabilities, especially for larger time steps. Constraint forces may also be included as part of the formulation as shown here. And then along with the accompanying unilateral kinematic constraint equations, we begin to see how contact models may be seamlessly integrated as part of soft body dynamics. Finally, the complementarity conditions for the residual velocity and contact constraint impulses may be written as we have seen before. Note that here we see the complementarity conditions in their standard form, but remember that we have seen variations of this formulation depending on the specific contact model that is being used. What is different, however, is how the contact Jacobian is assembled. We'll still assume that the Jacobian map generalized velocities to the contact frame, but as we've already seen, the generalized velocities are different for soft body models. Let us consider the case of a contact between a vertex of soft body A and a tetrahedron from soft body B. Contact point and normal are generated for this case. Since from body A only the vertex L is involved in the contact, we can say that the contact point P and the vertex L are coincident. However, from body B, it's a bit more complicated since there's not a single vertex involved in the contact, but rather a mesh element. Assuming that the contact point lies on the interior of, or the surface of the tetrahedral element, we can express the contact points as a weighted combination of the element vertex positions. For example, using an affine linear combination as shown here, where W, L, J, K, and M are the barycentric coordinates of the contact point with respect to the element vertices. Then, by writing the contact point position as an expression involving the node positions from each body, we have an equality that X sub L is equal to the weighted sum of positions from the vertices of body B. This then naturally leads to an expression for the relative velocity delta V at the contact point in terms of the nodal velocity V at each body. Note that again, various center coordinates are used to interpolate the nodal velocities from body B. Recall that the contact Jacobian maps the relative velocity from generalized coordinates to the, to the velocity in the contact frame. We can of course expand this expression and write it in matrix vector form. For the vector on the right, is comprised of the linear velocities of all nodes involved in the contact. For the matrix term, it's simply the contact Jacobian. Here we show the contact Jacobian for the nonlinear friction foam model, with the first, first row comprising the non-interpenetration constraint, followed by the frictional constraints in the tangent and bitangent directions. However, additional rows with additional tangent vectors could be added, for example, if we wanted to build the Jacobian for the linear polyhedral foam model. Also note that only the nodes involved in the contact are shown in this example, but typically soft body systems have many more degrees of freedom than the rigid body counterparts. And so the global Jacobian matrix can be quite large and sparse. Care must be taken to assemble the Jacobian to correctly index the non-zero blocks. The linear system for the constrained dynamics may be assembled using the Jacobian computed at each contact. More details on assembling this matrix are found in the course notes. Additionally, the reduced linear system that requires us to solve only for the constraint impulses may be computed by using the sure complement trick, as shown here. Note that two auxiliary variables, big W and little w, are used here to simplify the expression. Then, depending on the contact model formulation, we can apply the complementarity and feasibility conditions of the model. For instance, the box LCP conditions, as shown here. However, it's important noting that W rather big W is composed of the generalized mass matrix, damping, and stiffness matrices for the model. The mass matrix may be diagonalized, for example, by lumping mass at the nodes. However, the stiffness and damping matrices will generally not have a diagonal structure. Therefore, W is not trivial to invert. Rather, the expressions involving the inverse matrix are more efficiently computed by a linear solve, for instance, by using a sparse Cholesky factorization of W. Alternatively, elastic and damping forces may be computed explicitly, which would remove K and B from the lead matrix, as well as in the vector on the right-hand side. However, this would likely cause stability problems for simulation of stiff materials or simulations with large time steps. Now that we know how to model frictional contact, 
we'll examine aspects related to actually generating contacts during the simulation. The contact models introduced in the first part of the course are all based on the kinematics at a single point in the overlapping or touching region between bodies. And for this type of constraint formulation, there are three critical elements that are needed. First is the position of the contact. And this is the point in 3D space where the contact forces are actually applied to the bodies in an equal and opposite manner. As we'll see, this is usually a point that lies in the overlapping region between the bodies. Next, we need a contact normal. And this allows us to compute a contact frame that defines the direction of non-interpenetration impulses, but also the tangential directions of frictional forces. Finally, we need some estimate of the penetration between the two bodies, and essentially this will determine the value of the gap function. This is important for determining the amount of violation of non-interpenetration and whether a, resting, whether a contact is in a resting or penetrating state. Most often, it's the latter case, and thus the penetration is an important term in constraint stabilization to combat drift in the simulation. Collision detection is at the heart of contact generation. And there are two main types of collision detection, discrete and continuous. With discrete collision detection, it checks for overlap between bodies at only at specific time instants, for example, at each time step. And this is in agreement with the discrete time stepping scheme used to integrate the simulation. However, from one time step to the next, as body positions are updated using velocities, it's possible that bodies not only touch, but overlap. While it's generally impossible to avoid this type of interpenetration uh, with discrete collision detection, impulses or forces will be generated to resolve the overlap. Um, with continuous collision detection, the exact moment of collision is computed. This is particularly important for certain types of object shapes. For instance, if there's a thin or sharp feature in the geometry. And co continuous collision detection helps to prevent tunneling or extreme interpenetration scenarios. Essentially, the simulation state is advanced or reversed to the moment of contact, at which point a contact constraint may be generated and the simulation can continue from a penetration-free state. In this presentation, we'll focus just on the discrete collision detection case, but please note that details on continuous collision detection are provided in, this, in the course notes. In addition to discrete versus continuous types, it's important to also consider the scale at which collision detection is performed. In broad phase collision detection, algorithms use simple um, conservative tests of body shapes to quickly eliminate which pairs of bodies need to be tested with more exact collision tests. Examples of this class of collision detection method include bounding volume hierarchies or even spatial grid data structures. Whereas narrow phase collision detection is more focused on performing exact collision tests be between pairs of geometries. Um, these are more costly, but they are also the tests that we'll use to generate the contact points and normals um, used in our contact generation system. Um, often these tests boil down to special carefully crafted functions that perform a test between two specific object geometries. The geometry of each object may be of the same type or they may be different. In the course notes, we present details on narrow phase collision tests for different types of geometry, including analytical shapes, polygon meshes, and sine distance fields. And for the sake of brevity, we're going to take a closer look at the latter example, sine distance fields, and see how the essential components of our contact models may be produced using this type of shape representation. So sine distance fields are an implicit function that encode the shape of an object. And specifically, they are a scalar field that maps a 3D position to a sine distance from the surface of the object. And this is quite literally an encoding of the gap function. The sine returned by the scalar field is important here, with points inside the object returning a negative value, and points outside the object having a positive value, and points that lie directly on the surface having a value of zero. For example, in the figure on the right, the sine distance field of a circle is shown. Now the point x here has a positive value since it is outside of the circle. Whereas for a point on the inside of the circle, s of x would have a negative value. In addition to the sine distance, the gradient of the scalar field may be computed, which gives a vector field of gradient value values at each point in the domain of the field. Typically the gradient can be computed as a unit length vector 
And conveniently, this is the inward facing normal direction of the surface encoded by the field. For example, coming back to the 2D field uh, for a circle in the point X shown in the figure on the right, the gradient at X points away from the surface of the circle. However, the negative gradient direction gives the shortest path to move if X needs to be moved outside of the circle. With the scalar and gradient fields of the SDF available, let's consider how to gener generate a contact using this information. As you can probably, probably tell, the canonical test for collision with an SDF is using a point. If the query shape is a point, generating a contact is now trivial. As we've already noted, the penetration is simply the scalar value returned by the field. That is, phi is equal to s of x. And the contact normal is simply the gradient of the sine distance field at the query point. Recall that the gradient is the inward facing normal direction. And note that care must be taken here to compute either the inward or outward facing normal, depending on the convention used for the contact simulation. For example, if we want normals to point from body A towards body B, or body B towards body A. Finally, for the contact position, there are several options. And one option is to project the query point back to the surface uh, of the object along the gradient direction by a sine distance equal to the penetration. Alternatively, the query point itself may be used as the contact point, since, since after all, it is on the inside of the object. Using the case of SDF point collision as a building block, we can test collisions for more complex shapes. For example, consider an object whose shape is modeled using a polygon mesh, which is a common type of geometry used in many computer graphics applications. An SDF can be computed based on the mesh, giving regions inside and outside the surface of the mesh. Now, computing the SDF for a mesh may sometimes require that the mesh have certain properties, for instance, that it is watertight. However, robust algorithms do exist that can deal with more general polygon soups. Then consider uh, a second body also modeled as a polygon mesh. In order to generate contact between body A and body B, we can test each vertex of body B against the SDF of body A using the SDF point methodology proposed on the previous slides. Then we can swap the order of the test by computing an SDF for body B and testing all vertices from mesh A against the SDF of body B. The algorithm for mesh SDF collision can then be written rather concisely, as with the pseudocode shown here. It simply requires looping over all vertices in one body and then transforming the vertices into the local coordinate space of the SDF of the other body. And note that this is far easier than trying to transform the SDF into some other coordinate system. Finally, Whenever a vertex with a sine distance less than zero is found, a contact point and normal is generated. To summarize the process of generating contacts using sine distance fields and polygon meshes, um, we use the point SDF collision test as a starting point, which ultimately results in a straightforward algorithm for collision tests between objects of more complex geometry. However, artifacts can arise when the geometry contains sharp or thin features as shown here in the image from a related paper on SDF collision detection. One solution to avoid such problems is to increase the density of vertices used for the collision tests. Alternatively, recent work on SDF collision detection with meshes, meshes has proposed computing more exact collision points by using a local optimization over each face, face of the mesh. However, regardless of the geometry being used, robustness and exactitude are important characteristics for any collision detection method that is used for contact generation. And this section has given you a taste about how contacts are generated from object geometry. In the next section, we'll return to the complementarity formulations of frictional contact and explore some of the numerical methods used in graphics to solve these types of problems. The first class of numerical methods we'll explore in this section of the course are called pivoting methods. Specifically, I will explain the principal pivoting method for solving boxed LCPs. Then I will hand off to Kenny, who will take you through some of the finer details on splitting methods for the various types of LCP formulations used by our contact models. This will be followed by a section on non-smooth Newton-type methods. So let's begin with pivoting methods. <clears throat> 
And to understand pivoting, we'll first revisit the standard linear complementarity problem. Shown here is a variation of the polyhedral LCP and boxed LCP problems we saw earlier. But essentially, the variable x here is analogous to the constraint impulses. Whereas the residual x plus b corresponds to the relative velocities we computed for the contact frame. Now, pivoting methods are based on the idea that complementarity problems are fundamentally combinatorial in their nature. With the LCP formulation, variables may be labeled as one of two categories. In the first category, the relative velocity of the ith variable is zero, which means that x can have a non-negative value. For instance, this would be the case of sticking contact. Whereas in the second category, the relative velocity is non-zero, in which case the corresponding primary variable x must be zero. For instance, if we have the case of separating contact. The general idea is that we can group variables into these categories. As the algorithm proceeds to compute new solutions, for instance, if new variables are added or they change their value, variables are moved or pivoted between these categories. From the simple analysis, we, pro we propose to place each variable into a specific group based on its value. Another way to think of this is that by being in a specific category, there are certain presumptions we can make about the values of a variable. And there are two main categories we will consider, the free set and the tight set. And it, the tight category is further decomposed into tight lower and tight upper. Together, these categories allow labeling of the indices of all variables of a complementarity problem. And these groups are often called the index sets of the variables, meaning that they index variables that share the same label. For example, for the traditional LCP we saw a moment ago, uh, free variables would be defined as having a positive uh, x with zero relative velocity, and tight variables would have x equals zero. Essentially, tight here describes a variable that is directly against a hyperplane defining the limit of the inequality constraint, whereas free variables are not, and they have some room on all sides to change their value. Also note that in the context of pivoting methods, we combine x and v into our definition of a variable, since the two are coupled by the complementarity conditions. The general strategy used by pivoting, pivoting methods is to find the index sets that give the correct solution. And the correct solution is determined by a labeling of variables such that none of the variables violate their feasibility or complementarity conditions. Now in graphics, Baraf introduced an incremental pivoting algorithm uh, that solves for one variable at a time. It pivots variables between index sets as required. An important characteristic about this method is that um, any previously processed variable will never violate its complementarity condition since it will be pivoted if it does. So the method can, can solve an, an n variable problem in n steps, even though each step may be computationally costly. However, in earlier methods developed for pivoting, um, principal pivoting methods start with an estimate of the index set for all variables. And they begin by pivoting variables one at a time according to how badly uh, they violate the feasibility or complementarity conditions. And the pivoting method developed by Murdy falls into this class of method. However, later, a block pivoting version of this method was developed to pivot multiple vi variables simultaneously. And we'll take a look at the block pivoting approach in, in just a second. But first, let's do a quick revision of the boxed LCP we saw in section one of the course, since it's the formulation we'll use to understand how block pivoting methods function. Here, the lambda, uh, excuse me, here the vector of unknowns, x, is simply the vector of impulse constraints, lambda. Recall that there are lower and upper bounds on each lambda variable, and these determine if the value of a variable is infeasible or not. Also, the complementarity conditions highlighted here determine which index set a variable, a variable belongs to. Remember that the residual velocity is split here into positive and negative velocity components. These conditions on the impulses and residual velocities allow us to explicitly define the index sets for each category as follows. The free sets are variables where the corresponding constraint impulse is not restricted by the upper or lower bound. And this would be the case if the variable is a sticking friction contact or a resting contact. And in this case, we know that the residual velocity must be zero. We'll later exploit this fact to help us solve the related linear system. 
Furthermore, variables in the tight index set have their constraint impulse pulses limited by one of the lower or upper bounds. That is, the lambdas of this category are defined by the limit surface of the friction cone. In this case, the value is known. For instance, if the variable with index i is a frictional impulse and it's tight, then the value would either be negative mu times the normal impulse or positive mu times the normal impulse. Once each variable in the system has been assigned an index set label, this now permits a repartitioning of the boxed LTP according to the free and tight sets. Note that in addition to the partitioning of the lead matrix, as shown here, the vectors may also be partitioned. Here, we recall once again that for the free variables, by definition, the residual velocities v sub f are zero. And furthermore, for the tight lower and type upper uh, variables, the unknown um, x are in fact known and have a value defined by their bounds. This allows a rewrite of the equations involving only the first row of the partition system, which is the one associated with the free index set. This is nice, since here we have, uh, a reduced, we have reduced the problem to a simple unconstrained linear system, and any number of linear solvers may be used to solve for x sub f. Furthermore, this allows us to sketch out the main steps of the principal pivoting algorithm. Starting from an estimate of the index sets, we solve for the free variables. Then, check if the new solution violates any of the feasibility or complementarity constraints, and if any do, pivot the violated variables according to a set of rules and try again. Rinse and repeat. The pseudocode for the block principle pivoting algorithm perhaps makes this a bit clearer. And one of the most important steps here is how the index sets are updated, and it is during this step in which variables change index sets according to the pivoting rules. Now taking a closer look, we observe that free variables are pivoted to the tight set whenever the feasibility conditions are violated, whereas tight variables are pivoted to the free set whenever the residual velocity is the wrong sign. In other words, complementarity is violated. To better understand principle pivoting, let's consider a straightforward example, a box sliding on a plane. To simplify the analysis, we'll assume that only one non-interpenetration constraint and one friction constraint is generated by the collision. The alg algorithm begins with all variables in the free set. Here we show just the normal and tangential constraint impulses, but there are associated residual variables as well. The next step solves for the free variables, which computes a specific value for the non-interpenetration and tangent impulse components. However, Upon examining the friction impulse, the feasibility conditions of the constraint have been exceeded. This indicates that the variable needs to be pivoted, and thus the impulse is clamped to the bounds of the friction limit surface, and then moved to the tight lower index set. This now requires an update to the linear system, and we resolve for the free variables, which now only includes the non-interpenetration variable lambda sub n. Observe that at each step of the pivoting algorithm, there is a linear system to solve. If the direct linear solver is used, we can obtain an exact solution to the LCP, at least to the numerical precision permitted by the hardware. This is a nice characteristic of pivoting methods since iterative methods often produce more approximate solutions. However, there is, an, there is a higher computational cost associated with using a direct linear solver, especially for larger problems. For instance, if a Cholesky factorization is used to solve for the free variables, the factorization must be recomputed each time variables change index sets. Early work on pivoting methods suggested um, that using an incremental factorization could help improve efficiency. And more recently, researchers have noted efficiency improvements with low rank updates to an initial factorization. It's also possible that the principal submatrix may be non-positive definite which can occur for degenerate cases, for instance, when there are multiple redundant contact constraints. In this case, some matrix regularization can help. Next up, we'll be learning more about these iterative methods that I just mentioned. I will start with a general linear complementary problem.
The solution to this is given by any lambda that is complementary to the affine relation given by the matrix A and the vector B. For now, we keep things general and make no assumptions about the matrix A and the vector B. In the next step, I introduce the idea of splitting the A matrix into two terms that I call M and N. Later, I will get back to how exactly these M and N matrices may look like. For now, I just assume I have such a splitting such that A would be equal to M minus N. Given this splitting, I insert it into the definition of the given linear complementary problem and arrive at this new form. The next secret ingredient I add to the mix is to introduce iteration indices to the split version of a linear complementary problem. Here I use k as the iteration index. I use k plus 1 for all terms except the lambda term that is multiplied with the n matrix. Next I introduce the c vector, which depends only on the kth iteration lambda value. The kth linear complementary problem now algebraically look like this. Hence, when solving the kth linear complementary problem, all k values are given and I only need to solve for the lambda k plus 1 value. The whole idea behind the splitting and the iteration process is that I hope to replace a difficult linear complementary problem that was given by the A matrix with a sequence of simpler problems that individually are easier to solve. I need to create the splitting of the A matrix into the M and N matrices such that this happens. I will talk more about this later on. For now, I can observe that if the sequence of lambda solutions converge, then the limit point will be a solution to the original linear complementary problem. Let me clean up what I have so far. I created a sequence of sublinear complementary problems, where I know if they converge to a fixed point as k goes to infinity, then I have found a solution for my original linear complementary problem. My hope is that the splitting of the A matrix into the M and N matrices make the subproblems very easy to solve. Hence, my next step in my duration is to find a clever way to solve these subproblems. I will now use a minimum map reformulation of a linear complementary problem to convert it into a non-smooth root search problem. The minimum map reformulation simply takes the component-wise the minimum between the lambda k plus 1 vector and the vector given by the affine relation. I write the reformulation like shown here. Observe that it is a vector equation. The left side takes the component-wise minimum of its vector inputs. This type of reformulation opens up the doorway for many different types of non-smooth methods. There exist many different types of functions like psi that can recast a complementary problem into a non-smooth root search problem. I will show other examples later in this course. Such functions are called nonlinear complementary problem functions or NCP functions for short. I will now build a bit more intuition about this minimum map reformulation before I move on with my duration. I will consider two real numbers x and y. If these are complementary to each other, then it means that if one is positive, then the other must be zero. This can be written to require that both numbers are non-negative and their product must be zero. Often, the orthogonal symbol is used to write out the meaning of these equivalent statements. This is more readable and convenient to write down. Now I will do a case-by-case -case analysis based on the signs of the x and y variables. This means I have free by free table of all possible sign combinations. Looking at the table, I observe that only the sign combinations that result in zero are equivalent to the solutions to the complementary definition. Hence, this shows clearly 
that the minimum map reformulation did not change the solution to the linear combinatorial problem I am trying to solve. Now I have convinced myself that the minimum map reformulation algebraically is equivalent to a complementary condition. So now I will look at how this function is shaped. Here I plot the minimum value of two real numbers a and b. I see that I get this tent-like shape. I notice it is the zero-level isocontour that corresponds to valid complementary solutions. Observe that a large part of the tent shape is smooth. Only in the line where a is equal to b is the tent non-smooth. If I introduce an affine relationship between the y and x variables using the coefficients a and b, then I have a one-dimensional linear complementary problem. I can now very easily study the graph of the minimum map of the one-dimensional linear complementary problem for different values of the coefficients a and b. I clearly see the cusp in the transition between the two input parameters, marked by the star shapes here. Any intersection point with the zero line in this plot is a solution to the one-dimensional linear complementary problem. I mark them here with yellow circles. I notice that the purple curve has, that has negative coefficients has no solutions. The odd observation is that the intersection points are on straight lines and there are only two straight lines to consider. This is the insight I need for developing the subsolver. I want to do a case-by-case -case analysis to figure out which line the solution is on and then compute the intersection point. Armed with the idea of how to solve the minimum map reformulation, I will now return to the n-dimensional linear complementary problem from the splitting approach. So I have our minimum map reformulation of the subproblem from the splitting. Then I subtract lambda k plus one from this equation. Hereafter, I multiply by minus one. Doing this means the minimum becomes a maximum and the signs of both inputs are flipped. I now recognize that the root search problem I had from the minimum map reformulation has been converted into a fixed point problem as I have lambda k plus one values on both sides of the equation. So the fixed point formulation gave me this non-smooth equation to solve. I will now consider only the ith component of this non-smooth vector equation and do a case-by-case -case analysis. Two cases are relevant depending on the sign of the non-zero input argument. One case is for non-positive numbers and the other for positive numbers. I immediately see that the non-positive case has the simple solution of setting lambda equal to zero. The positive case looks a little trickier as I have a linear system on the left hand side. Hence, I will try and simplify the case a little more to clean it up. I now get a simpler linear system. It is still painful because I only want the ith component of the matrix vector product on the left side. Hence, in the general case, I cannot just invert the matrix to move it to the right-hand side of the equation. However, for very specific choices, the inversion can be done. So with that in note in mind, I arrive at the next equation. I now have the solution for the positive case. At this point, it may appear a little wild that I inverted the M matrix. However, clearly there will exist valid choices. Just consider that the M matrix is equal to the diagonal part of the A matrix. Then the inversion of each component is independent of each other and clearly possible. This choice is called a Jacobi method. I will later present other choices. Some of these implies a specific order on the I-index, 
I now have all pieces in place to formulate the first general version of a splitting method. I will now summarize. From the fixed point formulation, I derived two cases for finding the solution for the ith component of lambda k plus 1. If I recall the definition of the c vector and substitute this into the fixed point formulation, then I get this. I will now define the helper variable set. With this, I can now write up the solution update as a projection of the set vector. Therefore, this whole class of splitting methods I have derived are called projection methods. I will just show how the final algorithm looks like to give an idea of how to implement this in a simple way. Notice this is simply a for loop that in each iteration computes the value of the set vector and then projects it to find the updated lambda value. The outer loop is solving for the fixed point to the sequence of sublinear complementary problems and the projection inside the for loop is solving the actually linear complementary subproblem. Here, I just used a fixed number of iterations for stopping the outer loop. In a real implementation, one would use stopping criteria that test for how close one is getting to a fixed point. I can now introduce more choices for the splitting that will work in this scheme I have derived. To do so, I will introduce notation that splits our A matrix into a strict lower triangle part, a diagonal part, and a strict upper triangle part. I call these subparts for L, D, and U as shown here. Using this notation, I can now write up the splitting choices for the three most common methods that are used. The first row is the projected Jacobi method. The second row is the projected Gauss-Hortl method, called PGS for short. And the last row is the projected successive or relaxation method, called PSOR for short. The omega parameter is called the relaxation parameter, and it is a free parameter selected by the end user. Its value can range from 0 to 2. Omega can be used to tune the convergence behavior. For this reason, PSOR is preferred over PGS. Observe that if omega is equal to 1, then PSOR becomes PGS. PSOR is many times preferred or the projected Copy method too, because in practice it shows better convergence in many cases. However, there are cases where the Jacobi method is preferred. The main difference from these choices is that the Jacobi method can update all components in parallel, but it cannot do in-place updates. The PGS and PSOR versions comes with order dependency. The components must be solved in increasing order. But this allows them to use in-place updates. One can specialize the splitting method for the PGS and PSOR versions to produce a very simple and nice looking update equation. I will show how to do this next. I will start by investigate the PSOR splitting choice to see what this Omega business is actually doing. I will start by writing up the definition of the splitting of the A matrix and substitute in the PSOR choice. I can now clean up a little in this equation. I observe that this is just Omega multiplied with L plus D plus U. Now the sum of L, D, and U is A. So M minus N is just omega multiplied by A. I can get this into the linear complementary problem by writing it like this. Observe that omega is a positive number. This definition of the relaxed linear complementary problem has the same solutions as the unrelaxed version. You may be wondering what this omega parameter is good for. One way to think about it is that it rescales the A matrix. If you remember the minimum map reformulation plots, then the effect of omega is to change the slope of the second straight line. There are other interpretations of omega as well, but I will not 
get into this right here. Now that I understand the role of omega a little better, I will move on with deriving a nice update equation for the PSOL method. Remember the fixed point formulation I showed for the general splitting with M and N. I'll now use the PSOL choices for M and N and substitute them into the general fixed point formulation. Then I will look at the positive case for the IVE component. The aim is now to isolate the i component of the lambda k plus 1 term on the left side of this equation. Remember the problem is if I can invert the M matrix. The p sort choice will give a beautiful solution to this headache as I will show on next slide. Before doing this I will just convert the matrix multiplications into index notation. Observe how the matrix multiplications now are given by sums over the columns of L and U matrices. I already exploited the fill pattern of the matrices to avoid summing over interest in these matrices that I know is zero. The L term multiplied by the lambda k plus 1 vector is interesting. The headache is that I only want to solve for the ith component of lambda k plus 1. Here I have a whole lot of lambda k plus 1 components. However, I only have components where j is less than i. So if I assume that I solve for components using increasing i order, then this whole term is actually not unknowns, but are now known values, and I can move them all to the right hand side of the equation. After this, all that are left is to divide by DII term to get the equation I am looking for. It looks like this. So I have the main building block of the PSO update rule now. The next step is a matter of making the math look a little more pretty. First I factor all terms multiplied by omega. And then the term that are not multiplied by omega. Next step is to realize that I do not need to have a lambda k and a lambda k plus 1. In the i update, I only ever write to the i entry of a lambda vector. And I only read from the entries with j less than i. So this means I can use the same lambda vector. This is called in place update. If I define the r vector to be the residual vector like this, then I observe that my update formula is using the ith component of the residual vector. Substituting the r vector into the update equation, I can now finally write up the projection for p sol. I observe this nice and simple algebraical form that are implementation friendly. I can now finally present the specialized PSOR method for solving a linear complementary problem. Observe the outer loop iterates over the sequence of linear complementary problems, while the inner loop sweeps over all the components in increasing order and update them. Remember the for loop came from the L term that went into the M matrix when doing the splitting. It requires all lambda components before the i1 to have been solved before solving the i component. I will start by showing the definition of a boxed linear commentary problem. I have the affine transformation between lambda and v. The box linear commentary problem creates lower and upper bounds on lambda depending on whether v is positive or negative. If v is zero, then lambda can be anywhere between the lower and upper bounds. When I derive the splitting methods for the linear commentary problem, I use the minimum map reformulation to collect all my equations into one root search problem. 
I want to do the same with the boxed version. But the equations look more complicated. So I have to do a little work before I can get to the fixed point equation that was the core for developing the splitting methods. I will start by rewriting the second inequality to be greater than rather than less than. I just multiply by minus 1 to do this. The next ingredient is to rewrite v as a sum of positive and negative components. Observe that I have a complementary condition between the positive and negative components as a number cannot be both positive and negative at the same time. Hence this condition is truly fulfilled by construction. I will now use the new positive and negative components to rewrite the box complementary conditions. The result is given by these equivalent minimum map reformulations. It looks very complicated, but it is rather simple to verify that these minimum maps are correct. I can in fact draw it. I'll just make a small lambda and v coordinate system and mark the lower and upper bounds with these red lines. Observe the boxed complementary conditions only allow solutions to be on the red lines or on the horizontal lambda line between the two red lines. Now I can draw the affine transformation as a straight line in this figure. Here is one option. The star is the intersection point with the possible solution and hence is the solution one will get. Observe that v plus is positive and the first minimum map equation forces lambda equal to the lower bound. If I look at the second minimum map equation, then in this case v minus must be zero and since lambda is less than the upper bound, this equation truly says that zero is zero. Let me draw another possibility. This time the solution is between the lower and upper bounds as shown by the star. This means that v plus and v minus are both zero. In the first minimum map equation I have lambda minus l is positive and in the second u minus lambda is positive. So both minimum maps will be evaluated to zero as they should. Let me try to draw one last example. This time I am hitting the upper bound. I note that v minus will be positive and therefore the second minimum map equation will give me that lambda is equal to the upper bound. In the first minimum map I have v plus equal to zero and lambda minus the lower bound is positive. So this minimum map will be zero. I conclude that the minimum map reformulations are working. Observe, I did ignore the third equation completely. But that is because it is always fulfilled, so I can just drop it in my further derivations. So I have now these two minimum maps representing my box linear complementary problem. It is still not any good to me. I need to get one equation and not two equations. I will try and investigate if I can rewrite one equation such that I can substitute it into the other equation. I will consider the case when v plus is positive. Then v minus must be zero. This gives me the idea of subtracting v minus from both sides of the first minimum map reformulation. I can now see that with a little manipulation, this new equation could be substituted for v minus in the second minimum map. So there's hope this will work. But what if v minus was positive? Then I would not have subtracted zero. So maybe this will not work at all in all cases. Let me investigate what happens when v minus is positive, just to make sure I did not ruin it. If v minus is positive, then v plus must be zero. If v plus is zero, then by the first minimum map equation, I must have that lambda minus lower bound is non-negative. Using these facts about the signs, I see that the modified minimum map equation will select 
the negative input argument. This means I have V minus equal to V minus, which is always true. In conclusion, subtracting V minus did not do any harm to the model. Now I can just multiply by minus one and substitute in that V plus minus V minus is equal to V. Now I have the equation that I can substitute into the second minimum map equation. I have derived a one equation root search problem that is equivalent to the original box complementary problem. If I add lambda, then I get the fixed point formulation that I wanted. Now I am ready to apply the splitting idea. I'll just summarize. I have a fixed point formulation for the box linear commentary problem. Next, I just throw in the splitting. Do a lot of steps similar to what I did previously for the linear complementary problem. In the end, when I clean up the equations, I will have an update rule that looks like this. This is the P-saw version of the box linear complementary problem. In this form, it is not hard to see that I can reuse my implementation of P-saw for the linear complementary problem. All I need to change in my code is to project onto a box rather than to project to non-negative numbers. I've previously shown how to derive projection methods or splitting methods as they are also called. These has been very popular in interactive simulation. The main challenge with them is that they suffer from linear convergence rate. That means one has to use many iterations to get accurate solutions. Another alternative iterative method that potentially can offer a superlinear convergence rate or better is the Newton type of methods. They can get the job done using many less iterations. But the iteration cost is more expensive as it involves solving a linear system. I will first introduce the idea of recasting a general linear commentary problem into a non-smooth root search problem and from that develop a non-smooth Newton method. Afterwards, I go into the details of a nonlinear complementary problem that do not need a friction pyramid, but can solve the full nonlinear friction model. Many recent works in graphics field are based on such Newton method ideas. I will start by rephrasing my memory of how a Newton method works for solving a root search problem. I want to find the root of some vector function f. I'm given some initial value x that is not a root and is now looking for the solution x star, which is a root. My first step is to do a first order Taylor approximation around the initial x value. From this approximation called the Newton equation, I can solve for delta x, also called the search direction or Newton direction. Once I have delta x, I can use it to update the initial x value and obtain x star. The step of adding the search direction to the current value is called the Newton update. The updated value will not be the perfect root I am looking for, as there is some hopefully small error coming from the Taylor approximation. So I often need to repeat this process until my updated iterate is close enough to be a root. Sometimes the search direction is multiplied by a step length to improve on the convergence of this numerical method. I'll ignore this here and instead just focus on the raw building blocks that I need to build a Newton method. I need a f function and I need to be able to compute the derivative of f with respect to x. This is called the Jacobian of f. I will now start to find out how to reformulate a linear commentary problem into a root search problem. I'm given the linear commentary problem like this. I want to find the f function like this. To do so, 
I will make use of nonlinear complementary problem functions. These are also just called NCP functions for short. They are defined by any function where the roots are equivalent to the complementary condition or the solutions to the complementary conditions to be precise. There exist many different functions of this type. I have already shown how the minimum map is one such function. Here I just use the simple psi to denote any such choice. If I have an NCP function, then I can now define the root search problem as follows. So far everything appears very easy and straightforward. However, I need to consider how to compute the derivative of the NCP functions. Remember the minimum map function is non-smooth, so the derivative does not exist in the classical sense. Luckily, I can work with the generalization of the concept. I'll show this by example. The Fischer-Burmeister functions is one such NCP function and it is defined like this. The Fischer-Burmeister function is interesting because unlike the minimum map, it is smooth everywhere apart from the point where a and b both are zero. This can be seen easily if we plot the Fischer-Burmeister function. Observe the cusp at the origin. I can now create my f function by using the Fischer-Burmeister function. The only headache I have is to figure out how to compute the Jacobian of this Fischer-Burmeister root search function that I get. I'll start with getting the derivative of the Fischer-Burmeister function at points where the function is smooth. This means the point a, b is non-zero. Now I can take the smooth derivative by applying calculus. I will define these two extra helper functions that I call alpha and beta to mean the derivative with respect to a and b respectively. This is just convenient later on when I have to write up longer expressions. For now, I have ignored the single non-smooth point of the Fischer-Burmeister function. Clearly, I can see that alpha and beta becomes undefined if both a and b are equal to zero. According to theory, any element in Clark's generalized Jacobian, which is defined as the convex hull of the b subdifferential, will work for me to get a Newton method that will converge. There are infinite many choices in the generalized Jacobian, so I just arbitrarily pick one element that is nice looking. This means alpha is zero and beta is minus one when a and b are both zero. I use the Fischer-Burmeister function to reformulate the linear commentary problem into the non-smooth root search problem. I'll now apply the chain rule to the ith component of f to find the derivative with respect to xj. Observe that I get the partial derivative of xi and yi with respect to xj multiplied by the alpha and beta terms. The first partial derivative term is trivial to compute. For the second term, I need to remember that y is equal to a times x plus b. The notation is not very compact, so I will define the two diagonal matrices holding alpha and beta terms. Using these, I can finally write up the Jacobian that I need for the non-smooth Newton method in a quite elegant way like this. I have now shown how the linear commentary problem can be solved with a Fischer-Burmeister-Newton method. I will now take it one step further and show how to apply the Newton method for a nonlinear complementary problem model of a contact problem. So I need to show how I can put the nonlinear contact model into a NCP function. I'll just go with the Fischer-Burmeister function to be specific.
but in principle, the techniques I cover will work for any type of NCP function. I will start with the position level non-penetration constraints. Here, phi is the gap function, q is the generalized positions, and lambda n is the normal force. This complementary condition is reformulated to the root search problem, shown here. For the Newton method, I need to know the derivatives. They are fortunately easy computed like this. Many simulators use a velocity level non-penetration constraint. So I will also just quickly show how to work this. It looks like this. Here, Vn is the relative velocity in the normal direction at the point of contact. The reformulation follows like this. Finally, the derivatives are given by this equation. The contact space velocity is a linear function of the generalized velocities given by the u vector here. This means I am interested in the partial derivative with respect to the generalized velocities, velocities and not position. The partial derivative of the contact space velocity Vn with respect to the generalized velocities u is simply the Jacobian as seen from the kinematic relationship. I can substitute in the contact Jacobian in place of the partial derivative and computing the value of the partial derivatives of the non-smooth reformulation. Next, I will move on to show how we can incorporate friction. Now I will investigate how to model friction. I will start from the principle of maximum dissipation. Here Vt is the relative tangential velocity at the point of contact and lambda t is the friction force and mu is the coefficient of friction. Using the method of Lagrange multipliers, I can write out the Lagrangian for this minimization problem. Here gamma is the Lagrange multiplier. The first order of optimality conditions for this minimization problem can now be described by this set of equations. I use the simple S for the gradient of the Lagrangian. Observe how gamma now controls stick and slip behavior. The first order optimality conditions is a complementary condition, and this I use to reformulate the friction problem. Now I have a root search reformulation of the friction model given by the equation for the gradient equal to zero and the equation with the Fischer-Burmeister function, shown here in red boxes. I now have reformulations for both normal and friction forces, and all I'm missing to do is to put it all together with the Newton-Euler equations. I will do this next. To put everything together, I simply stack all equations I have on top of each other like this. Observe the first row is simply the Newton Euler equations. The Newton iterate vector given by x contains both generalized velocities, normal and friction forces, and Lagrange multipliers. The written notation can be a little verbose, so I will just ease up the notation clutter by using these two shorthand notations. With those in place, it is not very hard to write up the Newton equation. It looks like this. I noticed that even though the Jacobian matrix of F looks a little scary with all those partial derivatives inside of it, each partial derivative is pretty straightforward to evaluate as I have shown in previous slides. This means I can now assemble and solve for my Newton direction. The outline I used here just use notation for a single contact point. However, it is not hard to extend the system by stacking multiple contacts together into one subblock. The all structure stays the same. Next, let's examine a class of methods that extends many of the ideas we have seen with the projection methods, but into the nonlinear setting.
This allows us to use the nonlinear friction models directly in the numerical method. In fact, all of the splitting methods we have seen until now can be seen as special cases of the proximal operator methods. First, I will just outline what a proximal operator is. Here is the mathematical definition. The proximal operator returns the point in a convex set that minimizes the distance to a given input point set. Let me illustrate how this works. First, I need a convex set C. Observe that the convex set does not need to be smooth. This one has a small cusp on the right side of the boundary. Next, I need an input point set. The closest point in C is the point on the boundary with the smallest distance to set. Let me draw another point. This time, set is inside the convex set. C. The solution x star is now equal to set. Let me draw one more case. This time I observe that there are several input points that will map to the same non-smooth point on the boundary of the convex set C. On next slide I will investigate how the non-penetration condition can be rewritten into an equivalent proximal operator model. I will just write out the complementary condition that I use to model non-penetration. Here I have that Vn is positive, then lambda n is zero, which means contact is breaking. Or I have that lambda n is positive, then Vn must be zero, and the contact is sustained. Next, I will just write up the proximal operator model. I observe it is a fixed point problem. The complementary problem and the fixed point problem has the same solutions as I will prove shortly. Observe here that two new things popped up. The convex set n that consists of all the non-negative numbers. It is not hard to see the relation between the n set and the unilateral constraints on the n and lambda n. However, the positive scalar i n is not as obvious. It works as a regularization parameter and has no impact on the solution. It is easy to see that if I multiplied Vn in the complementary condition with Rn, then I just rescaled Vn but did not change its sign. Now I have built this intuition, I can go more into showing me details of this. To get to the details, I will just do a case by case analysis. Let me start with the convex set N. I will assume that lambda is positive. If Vn is positive, then lambda n minus Rn times Vn must be on the left of lambda n. On the other hand, if Vn is negative, then lambda n minus Rn times Vn will be on the right of lambda n. Looking at the proximal Operator model, I can now see that only if Vn is zero, then I have a solution for this model. This holds for any positive value of Rn. Next, I will consider the case of lambda n equal to zero. As before, I will consider two possibilities of Vn being positive and negative. I notice that in the positive case, the proximal operator will return zero, whereas in the negative case, I have a point inside my convex set N. So I conclude that the proximal operator model can only hold if Vn is positive. This concludes my case by case analysis. I have shown that the solutions for the proximal operator are the same as the complementary problem conditions. This took care of the normal force part. I will next describe how friction can be rewritten into a proximal operator model. For the friction forces, 
I have some friction cone that describes all feasible friction forces. And I have some relative sliding velocity Vt. I illustrate the friction cone here as a limit surface drawn in the contact plane spanned by the x and y axis. For now, I assume normal forces is some fixed value. The friction force will oppose the sliding motion. This means the friction force will be in the half space pointing away from the sliding velocity. This means the instantaneous power of the friction force will be negative. That means friction is dissipating energy. Principle of maximum dissipation says the friction force solution will be the friction force that dissipates most energy. This is the force that are mostly in opposite direction of Vt. Observe that the friction force may not be directly opposing Vt as shown in the example here. A different way to look at this is to look at the difference between two friction values. Here, gamma t and lambda t. If lambda t is more dissipative, then the difference of the two friction forces dotted with Vt will be positive. As the example shows, the green arrow being the force difference and the sliding velocity vector makes a positive dot product. This means that for lambda t to be most dissipative, then the difference vector with all other possible feasible friction forces must make a non-negative dot product with the sliding velocity. This mathematical form is known as a variational inequality. To get to the proximal overrator model, I make the observation that all those green vectors will be in the tangent cone at lambda t. So let me just draw the tangent cone here explicitly to make that connection clear. The tangent cone is characterized by having minus Vt as its normal cone. This means that if I shoot out a ray from lambda t in the direction of the normal cone, then any point on that ray will have lambda t as its closest point in the friction cone. This gives me the connection to the proximal operator model for friction. Notice here that the R value is basically the ray length of the point that will have lambda t as closest point. Any positive R value will have the same lambda t as solution. I have now explained how non-penetration constraints and friction forces each are modeled with a proximal overrator. I will now combine these two models into one model. The result looks like this. The nice thing about the R values is that they do not influence the solution. The R values affect the convergence constant. I will demonstrate how later on. For now, I'm happy to notice that the combined model is a fixed point problem. I can think of the right hand side as some non smooth function that I here just call f. This first combined version of the proximal overrator model already reveals a few beautiful traits. Notice that the physics goes straight into the mathematical model without any need for discretization of, for instance, the friction cone. It is a model that stays very close to the underlying principles. The current version does not quite reveal all the nasty coupling that goes on, so I will route out dependencies a little more by using the fact that the relative contact velocities is an affine transformation of the contact impulses. Now the fixed point formulation looks like this. Observe how lambda t is coupled into the normal part through the A and F subblock. Similar for the friction part, the lambda n is coupled by the AFN subblock. However, 
there is a third coupling too. Notice that lambda n is also an input parameter to the friction cone. When I solve the proximal operator model, I must consider all these couplings between the variables. Currently, I will, without loss of generality, just pose the model for a single point of contact to avoid cluttering up the math with a lot of indices. Extending to n contacts means that I will have n such simultaneous equations and the a subblocks will create couplings between different contacts too. I will now extend to n contacts. I will do this by using this set vector shorthand notation for lambda minus r times a times lambda plus b. Here r is now a matrix that collects all the r values using this shorthand not notation. I will get k equations of this form. Solving this last fixed point problem can be done by a fixed point iteration. Here is one example of how this can be done. I put lambda values from iteration k into right hand side and use the proximal operator to compute an updated lambda value for the k plus 1 iteration. I will continue looping until the difference in lambda values suggests I am converging to a fixed point. There are two typical variations on how to update the set values and the friction cones. One version solves all contacts simultaneously and use lambda values at the kth iteration to compute all set values and friction cones simultaneously before solving all proximal operators simultaneously too. This is a nice embarrassingly parallel process. I call this a Jacobi scheme. The version I showed here assumes normal forces are solved before friction forces and hence I use the most updated normal force for generating the friction cone. One can extend the idea of using the most updated values as soon as they are available. This means one solves contacts one by one and update the set values accordingly to always have the most updated version. This I call a gauss seidel scheme. I have now introduced the basic idea of the numerical method for solving the proximal operator model. I'm now ready to go into a little more detail. Here I have shown the final Gauss-Seidel scheme of the proximal operator method using an adaptive R-factor strategy. Observe that there is a two-loop structure to the algorithm. The inner loop takes one sweep over all contacts and for each contact it first solves the normal part of the proximal operator model and then it solves the friction part afterwards. The outer loop continues doing these sweeps over all contacts until I have converged to a fixed point. However, there are some details to this algorithm that needs a little more explanation. The first detail that pops up is this W vector that I use to compute the set vector value before giving it as input to the proximal operators. What goes on here is that I exploit a factorization of the coefficient matrix A. Recall this affine equation. The A matrix is given by the Jacobian times the inverse mass matrix times the Jacobian transpose. If I just add parentheses here, and call this term w, then the connection to the two red boxes is quite clear. However, I update the w2 vector right here too. That is just after I know how I change the lambda values for the ith contact. Then I go in and immediately update the w vector. This is computational cheaper than doing a full recompute like the one I did in the top red box. I'm now done with the sweep over the contact points. The next thing that happens is a convergence test in line 12 of this algorithm. If I detect divergence, then I will do the R values right here. If the scheme is converging, I will accept the new iterate right here. This is the most 
simple way to control the R values. Other schemes can be used. The important thing to remember is that for smaller values, I am guaranteed to converge, but it goes slower. For larger values, it goes faster, but I risk divergence. I will now show an example of how the fixed point iteration work on the proximal operator model. I start with a convex set that is a blue disk. The initial iterate is shown by the yellow dot. Then I move the distance r in the minus v direction to get the new set vector that is input to the proximal operator. I have marked this here with a red dot. The solution of the proximal operator gives me the closest point on the blue disk. This is the next iterate in the fixed point iteration. I repeat the steps now and I get the next iterate and the next and the next and the next. It is obvious that if I continue this way, I will end up very close to the north pole of the blue disk. This is the point on the disk where minus V will be in the normal cone. Using the example, I can now investigate the effect on the fixed point iteration when I change the R value. Here on the left, I have displaced the iterates as the algorithm moves from positive x-axis to the north pole. I rescale the trajectories so they are plotted on a disk with a radius equal to the R value. This is just so the plot will not clutter up and we better can compare how fast each R value moves towards the north pole. I observed that for small R values I get many iterates, while for larger R values I get less iterates. A different way to analyze this is to measure the fixed point residual and take a log plot of this error measure. This is shown on the right. Clearly for this example, I have linear convergence rate and I see that the R value is directly related to the convergence constant. Using larger values goes faster. This little analysis show the tendencies clearly. Try to use a large R value is better. However, the example does not show what happens if the R value goes too big. In this case, the fixed point iteration may diverge. Hence, it is non-trivial to figure out what the optimal R value is. Hence, I propose in the gauss seidel scheme I presented to adaptively change the R value. The idea was to test if the scheme is convergent or divergent. If it is divergent, then the R value is decreased until convergent behavior is obtained. Although I did not show it, one could increase the R value if, for instance, one had experienced convergent behavior for many consecutive iterates. Let me just show an example that is slightly more complex than the blue disk. Here I created a little ball simulator. There are no friction forces in this simulator. Only non-penetration conditions is handled. I will compare an adaptive R-factor strategy for the proximal operator against the classical projected successive or relaxation method known as PSOR. I tuned by hand the relaxation parameter for PSOR to work well. While the simulations run, I plot the convergence rate of the two solvers so I can have a side-by-side -side view comparison. There are many interesting observations to make from watching these small videos. First of all, PSO is not monotone decreasing. Sometimes it behaves erratic and may even diverge a bit. The prox gauss seidel scheme is clearly always strictly decreasing and often gets to a smaller error. Even though the two simulations have the exact same initial conditions, it is clear that the solution outcomes are different. Hence, it really matters what type of solver one uses and how accurate the forces are solved for.
the last observation I will make here is that adapting the R value seems to give me a convergence rate that are super linear. This can also be observed in more complex 3D simulations. So the conclusion I draw from this is that it can really pay off to adaptively change the R value. We will now have a closer look into how contact problems involving soft bodies are formulated and solved. We have previously shown that in the rigid body case, a semi-implicit time integration scheme combined with the contact constraints resulted in a complementary problem formulation, which we could solve for the Lagrange multipliers and then do a velocity and position update afterwards. This ready body approach for dealing with the time integration is rarely used for soft bodies. Here, the flavors are more implicit in time and this results in a nonlinear formulation like root finding problems or minimization problems. For soft body approaches, constraint based formulations are not always the typical way to model contact forces. Here, penalty methods are quite often used too. Particular barrier methods are quite popular. In this part of the course, we will cover how to deal with the more implicit time integration for soft bodies, both for the constraint based and the penalty based contact modeling approaches. We will start with a quick review of notation and terminology. We consider the world we are simulating to consist of a soup of tetrahedral elements. Some of the tetrahedral elements are connected into subsets. Such connected components, like the one shown here in red boxes, can easily be thought of as a single soft object. All the nodal positions of the tetrahedral elements are collected into one generalized position vector that we call Q. The generalized position vector is time dependent, and the time derivative, the generalized velocity vector, is just the collection of nodal velocities. We use the symbol u for the generalized velocity vector. We write a dot above a variable to show that it is the time derivative. This allows us to quickly write up the kinematic relationship between the generalized position and velocity vectors. Later, when we write out the contact models, we will need to determine the state of a contact. That is whether we have sustained or separating contact or sticking or sliding motion. Hence, we wish to derive an equation that says something about the relative velocities at a point of contact. When two tetrahedral elements come into contact, then this is often represented by a shared point between the two elements. Let us call the two elements A and B and the shared point for P. This shared point can be written in terms of the barycentric coordinates of element A as well as the barycentric coordinates of element B. Let us call these two ways of expressing the shared point for PA and PB. Obviously, at time of contact, we have that P, PA and PB are all equal. The relative velocity at the contact can now be written as the difference of the time derivatives of PA and PB. The time derivatives are easy to compute because the barycentric coordinates are constant. We care about the relative velocity as this tells us something about whether the two elements are moving apart or sliding against each other. Hence, we like to have the relative velocity as seen in the local contact space defined by the contact normal n, the tangent vector t, and the binormal vector b. Putting the pieces together, we recover an equation that tells us how to compute the contact Jacobian, which maps the nodal velocities into relative velocities in the contact space. We use the symbol j for the Jacobian matrix. With this equation in place, we have both the tool for creating an algorithm that can assemble the Jacobian matrix and a formula for modeling contact constraints based on relative contact velocities. The red box shows how to compute the contact Jacobian matrix for two tetrahedral elements. The course notes explain how to extend to multiple elements. The last ingredient we need to review before going into the details of the soft body contact approaches is the equation of motion. It is shown here. It is a second order ordinary differential equation 
all spatial discretization approaches, including using mass spring systems, end up with an equation that has the same algebraical form as the one we show here. On the left hand side, we have the mass matrix M multiplied by the generalized acceleration. And on the right hand side, we have the sum of all forces. These are the external forces, the damping forces, the elastic forces, and the contact forces. We use the subscripts to indicate the type of the force term. There are two important and different approaches for modeling the contact forces. Item 1 models contact using some constraint equation, which must be added to the above equation. Here we use the notation of a nonlinear combinatorial problem function that takes the gap function phi as one of the arguments and the Lagrange multipliers as the second argument. In this case, the contact force term ends up being the term with the Jacobian transpose times the Lagrange multiplier lambda. The Lagrange multiplier is known as a dual variable and hence the constraint-based approach is known as a dual form. The other approach models contact forces using the negative gradient of some potential energy function, which depends on the generalized position and velocity. This is called the primary form because Q and U are known as primary variables. We reformulate the second order differential equation to a coupled system of first order differential equations. This is the differential equations that are our starting point for working out the different time integration schemes. We have now covered enough basic terminology and can move on. Let us begin by looking at how the time integration of a soft body system can be rewritten into a root finding problem. We will start with the equations of motion written up as a coupled system of first order ordinary differential equations. We will then apply an implicit Euler method to discretize time. Observe we are using superscripts to indicate the time when a quantity is evaluated at. The time described equations are rewritten to define the nonlinear vector function f primary. We have now uncovered the root finding problem form. Problems of this type can be solved efficiently with Newton's method. Let us briefly recall how Newton's method works for a root finding problem like ours. Newton's method is an iterative method. In each iteration, it linearizes the root finding problem by replacing nonlinear terms with a first order Taylor approximation taking around the current iterate value of Q and U. This results in a linear system that can be solved for the updates delta Q and delta U. Observe we are using superscripts to indicate the iteration at which a value is evaluated at. After having solved for delta Q and delta U, Newton's method update the current iterates to give the next iterates. This update step can be improved by adding a line search and a step size to it. We will ignore this here and refer to our course notes for more details. After the update step, Newton's method is ready for the next iteration. Our task now is to show how to derive the linear system that must be solved in each iteration of Newton's method. We start from the nonlinear vector function f primary. To solve for delta q and delta u, we perform a first order Taylor approximation to all the nonlinear force terms. The approximations look like this. Here the B and K matrices are the damping and stiffness matrices. Notice that we use superscript on these matrices. This is because they could depend on the current value of the generalized position and velocity. The H matrices are the Hessian matrices of the contact potential energy function. In some modeling approaches, the potential energy is not dependent on generalized velocity and hence the Hessian term HU will be zero. Let us substitute the Taylor approximations into F primary. After some cleaning up, we get this vector equation. It can be prettified a bit more by exploiting that delta Q is equal to H times delta U. This gives us this linear system to be solved for 
delta u and delta q. Hence, in dealing with a soft body contact problem using the primary form of the root finding approach, one must assemble and solve this linear system in every iteration of the Newton method. We have now seen the primary form of the root finding approach. Next, we will show the dual form version of this approach. We will rewind back to the equations of motion and immediately replace the contact force term with the Lagrange multiplier term, as well as add the constraint equation that models the contact. This gives the system equations we have shown here. We use a nonlinear complementary problem function psi to model the contact. Our course notes include specific detailed examples on how to do this using the minimum map and Fischer Burmeister functions. For now, we just keep it general and use psi as a generic placeholder. In the next step, we apply the implicit Euler method to time discretize our equations. Observe that we ensure the constraints are fulfilled at the end of the time step. The system of discrete equations can now be rewritten into a vector notation as shown here. The left hand side of this nonlinear function we wish to find the root of in order to solve the dual version of the implicit time stepping approach. As we did for the primary problem, we may now substitute in first order Taylor approximations for all nonlinear terms. Doing this and a little manipulation of the math, then one obtains this linear system to solve. To make the math a little more readable, we introduce the shorthand notation of the A matrix and B vector. Solving this linear system gives us the update values to use for U and Q as well as for the Lagrange multiplier lambda. In a practical implementation, one would not solve this full system directly, but instead apply a sure reduction to solve only for the Lagrange multiplier. In making the Taylor approximations, we assume the contact decobian to be time independent. For very small time steps and small velocities, this is often the case. If this assumption does not hold, then one could replace the Jacobian term with a Taylor approximation as well. We will now outline a different approach which recasts the time integration into a minimization problem. To show how this works, we will start by postulating the immunization problem, and then we will show that the first order optimality conditions is the same as the time discretized equations of motion. Before writing up the minimization problem, we will define Q tilde. This is the unconstrained generalized position one would obtain if only external forces was acting on the system. Now with Q tilde, we can state the minimization problem like shown here. Observe we have a quadratic term with the mass matrix, a term with the elastic potential energy, epsilon e, and the last term is maximizing the work done by damping forces. Observe the unilateral constraints saying gap function phi should be non-negative. To show that any first order optimizer to the minimization problem is a correct time update, we start by writing up the Lagrangian. Next, we write out the first order optimality conditions for the unilateral constraint minimization problem. We observe that they nearly have the same form we are looking for. Our strategy is to show that these conditions are identical to the full implicit discrete equations of motion. That is the set of equations that look like this. We will just keep these equations around so we can remember them. Now we are ready to go back to the optimality conditions and rework these. We use a nonlinear complementary function psi to rewrite the unilateral constraints into this. Now we remember the definition of the objective function, the Jacobian and the elastic forces. Substituting these into our equations and cleaning up gives us this. Now we recall that the velocity times h is the time difference of a generalized position. Using this, we can rewrite positional terms into velocity terms like this. Observe that we added the equation that defined the u plus h vector. Comparing our equation to the desired target, we observe we are close, except that the gamma term is divided by h and not multiplied by h. This is because gamma is not the same Lagrange multiplier as lambda, 
But if we rescale our constraint function and replace accordingly with our lambda Lagrange multiplier, then we have algebraically shown the equivalence we wanted. The last rescaling step can be done as it does not affect the nonlinear complementary function. We just saw that the position level minimization process for the dual form was exactly equal to the time discretized version of our equations of motion. One can derive the primary form in a similar fashion. Here we'll just show the minimization version for the primary form. The primary form of the minimization approach is perhaps even more straightforward as the contact forces are modeled from a minimization of an energy penalty function. We simply replace the constraint force term with the corresponding epsilon c term. The primary form has the added advantage of being unconstrained. This position level minimization approach is very popular when using barrier functions to model contact. Up to this point, we have covered the general theory of how to do implicit time stepping of soft body contact problems. We will outline a few different dual form methods and show that these can be interpreted as different choices of preconditioners. Before going into details, we need to set up our framework for talking about preconditioners. We will start by sharing the time discretized equations for the dual form. Here we have chosen to model the contact constraint with complementary constraints rather than using an equivalent nonlinear complementary problem function. Observe that in this form, we have not yet made decisions about whether damping or elastic forces should be treated explicit or implicit in time. Hence, we simply use the simple tau as a placeholder for now. The gap function is now replaced by a first order Taylor approximation. From this linearization, we can define the contact velocity vector v and the gap error vector epsilon. We will substitute this linearization and definitions into the dual form formulation. When we do this, the dual form changes into this new formulation. We observe that this changes the formulation from using position level constraints into using velocity level constraints. We have this velocity level dual formulation for our contact problem. Observe that some force terms are evaluated at time tau. The idea is to use the first row to find a formula for computing ut plus h. The concept of precondition comes in here in terms of how one approximately solves this equation for the u vector compared to solving the equation exactly for the case of a full implicit time stepping method. That is when picking all tau values equal to t plus h. Next step is to substitute the formula for the precondition u t plus h solution into the third equation and obtain a formula for the contact velocity vector v. Here we introduce the symbol p for the preconditioner matrix used in solving for u t plus h. Observe that we use a subscript on the w matrix to specify what type of preconditioner that has been used. The w matrix is known as the Delusus operator. The preconditioner matrix can be interpreted as how well it approximates the inverse matrix for a full implicit time update. In the following, we will derive several examples of different p-matrices. The specific algebraical expression for p-matrix depends on the choices for explicit and implicit time discretizations of the tau terms, as well as whether an approximate solution for ut plus h is used. Finally, we expand the fourth equation with this new expression for the v-vector to obtain the complementary problem that allows us to solve for the Lagrange multiplier. We have now outlined the general framework needed to start investigating different choices of preconditioners. Next, we will present a quick overview of the preconditioners covered in our course notes. Each of the preconditioners listed here are equivalent to a specific method for solving the soft body contact problem. The first example uses mass slumping and explicit time discretization. This leads to a very fast method, but it is very sensitive to instabilities. The second example is the so-called backward Euler method. This was originally proposed for cloth simulation and can handle quite large time steps, but has the disadvantages of having to invert a large matrix. 
the next two examples are based on Chulisky factorization. Here one exploits the factorization either to compute the Delisus operator in a fast parallel way or avoid building the Delisus operator. We refer to the course notes for a derivation of the two Chulisky preconditioner approaches. Finally, we present a version of the backward Euler method which applies a Jacobi method to approximately solve for the generalized velocity. This gives a method that is both fast and simple to implement. Its convergence rate is linear. This method is known as the iterative constraint anticipation method. This systematic way of describing methods as different preconditioned choices gives us a powerful tool for understanding and comparing methods. Let us go back to the first and third equations in our preconditioner outline. We make the choice now that all tau terms are explicit in time. Next, we use the first equation to find a closed form solution of ut plus h. If we assume we have lump mass matrix, then the m matrix is easy to invert as it is a diagonal matrix. Next step is to insert our formula for ut plus h into the equation for the d vector. From this, we can now find the expression for the Delusus operator as well as the part that need to go into the right-hand side vector wp. This completes the duration. We can now write out the complementary problem with this preconditional choice. We can further observe that this preconditioner will only work well when time steps are very small. The resulting complementary problem is rather friendly for a projected Gauss-Seidel type of solver. Let us now derive a more implicit method. Hence, we choose t plus h for the tau terms now. This is a nonlinear equation. We could rewind back to the root finding approach to deal with the true implicit nature of this. We will not do this here. Instead, we're just going to make some linearization and plug this directly into our current equation and only go with this. Hence, this type of precondition can be seen as a simplification to the root finding problem where only a single iteration of the Newton method is used. Observe the matrix A that we have derived now. It shows us that the precondition we have now will be ideal. Only catch is that we only do one Newton iteration in this method. Next, we solve for u t plus h by inverting the A matrix. Then we substitute the equation for u t plus h into the equation for the v vector. Finally, we can now identify all the terms we need to write up how this preconditioned problem is defined. The resulting complementary problem is this. This method is much better at dealing with larger time steps than the one with explicit time discretization. The price to be paid is the inversion of the A matrix. This can be quite computationally expensive because for soft bodies, this matrix system scales in the number of nodes we have in our mesh. We saw how the backward Euler method was derived and that its precondition had many nice properties. Unfortunately, it required us to invert the A matrix. In this next precondition, we will outline the idea is to overcome the computational disadvantages of this. The trick will be to use the splitting method to get an approximation of u t plus h vector. Let us rewind the derivation of the backward Euler method to the point where we found the A matrix. We will introduce the auxiliary vector b to help make the math more readable. Using this, our equation for the u t plus h vector becomes this. Instead of solving directly for u t plus h, we will instead introduce a splitting of the A matrix. This means we think of A as the sum of its strict lower triangular part, its diagonal part, and its strict upper triangular part, here given by the symbols L, D, and U. In our equation, we have moved the L and U terms to the right-hand side of our equation. This results in a fixed point problem. Hence, we solve for the u vector by iterating on the k index. This only requires inversion of the diagonal matrix D. The next step 
it is to plug our approximation for the u vector into the equation for the v vector. Then we identify the Delusus operator and corresponding vector parts. Observe that the Delusus operator now looks a bit more like the WM preconditioner case. This all ends up in a complementary problem that must be solved in the kth iteration of this approach. Only right hand side vector W D depends on the kth iterate. What we learn from this is that we get a kind of Jacobi preconditioner. It gives us a quite simple Delusus operator, but we must solve multiple complementary problems to converge to UT plus H. To illustrate the iterative nature of the splitting method, we will just briefly have a look at a pseudocode outline. In step one, we update the Jacobi iterate for the generalized velocity. In step two, we use this updated velocity to compute the right-hand side vector WD that defines the complementary problem. In step three, we solve the complementary problem. Here, one can apply projected Gauss-Sortl method due to the nice properties of the Lucis operator. In step four, we have solved for the new Lagrange multipliers and can now update the value for the generalized velocity iterate. As the pseudocode illustrates, one ends up having one complementary solver embedded inside an iterative linear system solver. Up to this point, we've mostly focused on constraint-based methods for contact handling. In this section, I will present two alternative methods of contact handling, namely penalty and barrier-based methods. Penalty methods replace contact constraints with spring-like forces. Take, for example, these two contacting circles. From the point of contact, we create a zero rest length spring. This spring introduces forces that penalize penetration. Just like a one-dimensional spring model, this fictional spring has a stiffness. In this case, the stiffness controls how quickly the penalty forces grow. A simple penalty method might look like this. First, we detect contact points using collision detection. Sticking with the circles, we can see that in a time step, they go from not contacting to intersecting. We can then use continuous collision detection to find the point of contact. We then define the spring forces based on the penetration depth. Similarly, in rigid bodies, we can map this point-wise force back to a torque using the radial vector r. Third and last, we integrate these external forces into our equations of motion and move our circles forward in time. Adding friction to our penalty-based model involves defining a fixed point A and tracking how A moves over time. The penalty friction force is then A minus P. The force is, can be scaled by stiffness to increase the friction force. Distinguishing between static and dynamic friction depends on the relationship between the friction force and the penalty force. If F friction is smaller than mu times F spring, then we can say that the contact is experiencing static friction. Otherwise, the fixed point A is updated so that the inequality holds. The problem with penalty methods is they cannot prevent intersections and tunneling. So we turn our attention to barrier methods. Barrier methods replace discrete penalties with barrier functions. Barrier functions are functions that grow to infinity as the distance shrinks to zero. One commonly used barrier function is, in numerical methods is the log barrier. A recent example of the success of barrier methods can be found in incremental potential contact by Lee and colleagues in 2020. The goal of this work is to robustly simulate deformable objects with a guarantee of remaining intersection free. In this example, we see a lot of contact between intertwined parts. As the ball bounces away, we see that everything remains intersection free and produces plausible results. As we recall from our earlier discussion on soft body dynamics, we can write our time integration as an optimization where contacts are handled as constraints. 
Some common examples of these constraints are volume and gap constraints. Volume functions measure the sign volume between a point and surface element. Similarly, gap functions measure the sign distance between a point and a plane passing through a surface element. Unfortunately, satisfying these constraints robustly is challenging, especially if we want to model f and phi accurately as nonlinear functions. To address this, IPC enforces constraints using barrier functions added to the objective. This then forms an unconstrained optimization, which as we will see can be robustly solved using Newton's method with line search. The barriers are applied to distances between elements. As the distance decreases, the repulsive forces grow to infinity. Rather than using a plain log barrier, IPC uses a C2 clamp barrier. This means as distances go above the value of d hat, the barrier exerts no contact force. Because the clamping is C2, we can apply Newton-based optimization without harming convergence. An important part, though, is how the distances are computed. If we take, for example, our standard volume-based constraint or gap-based constraint, we can see that we can violate the constraints without introducing interpenetrations. Instead, IPC uses unsigned distances, which update as the elements deform. By doing so, we can define a globally consistent contact constraint. Our focus here is on collisions with triangle meshes. So, in order to define our distance-based constraints, we need to define the distance between two triangles. The distance between two triangles can be broken down into two subproblems. First is the point triangle distance, and second is the edge-edge distance. The minimum of these subcombinations is equivalent to the minimum of our triangle-triangle distance. Computing the point triangle distance involves solving a small constraint-based optimization. Here, u and v are the barycentric coordinates of the triangle, and the constraints are such that the closest point falls within the triangle. Luckily, this optimization has an analytical solution and involves decomposing the problem into a few subproblems. We can decompose the space as such. The green region indicates that the point is closest to a point along the edge. In this case, we can find the closest point and minimum distance through the use of a point line distance, where the line passes through the points x2 and x3. The red region indicates that the point is closest to the vertex of, a tri of the triangle. In this case, we can compute the distance as the normal point-point distance in 3D space. And lastly, if the point falls in the blue region, it is closest to a point on the interior of the triangle. In this case, we can compute the distance as the distance between a, a point and a plane passing through the triangle. Finding the distance between two edges is similar. We have a small constraint-based optimization, where here A is the parameter along the first edge and B is the parameter along the second edge. We can again decompose this into a few subproblems. Here, for example, the point x3 is closest to a point on the interior of the edge x1 to x2. However, in this example, x1 is closest to the point on the interior of the edge x3 to x4. And in another example, the two edges share a closest point on the interior. So, finding the solution to this minimization involves computing which subproblem we are in. Now that we understand how IPC's optimization problem is defined, we can see how it's solved. We do this through the use of a projected Newton method, which looks something like this, where here f is an alias for our objective, and q0 can be simply set to qt. We start by initializing our active contact set, c, and then we perform an iterative process until our gradient is less than some epsilon tolerance. In each iteration, we compute the projected Hessian. The projection is to the space of positive definite matrices. This is important in order to ensure that our update step leads us to a decrease in the energy. Next, we can compute the update direction as the negative of the Hessian inverse times the gradient. 
Then we can compute a collision-free step size alpha through the use of a CCD-aware line search that we'll discuss more in the next slide. Then we can compute an update to our, to our positions, QI plus 1, and again update the active contact set. It's important to update the active contact set at every iteration in order to ensure the feasibility of our solution. Lastly, our Q star can be then used as the next positions in the time. Now let's take a look at the line search function. A standard backtracking line search might look something like this. The goal is to find an alpha scaling for our step that leads to a decrease in energy. We start with an alpha equal to 1 and perform a loop that finds a decrease in our objective. If we do not find a decrease, we can shrink the alpha by one half and repeat. Unfortunately, this first attempt does not guarantee we satisfy our constraints. Take for example, this point and edge. If the point is undergoing a large deformation, we can jump over the barrier and end in a lower energy state as the resulting distance is larger than the initial one. To address this, IPC proposes a method of CCD-aware line search. Here the initial value for alpha is set to the earliest time of impact. By doing so, we rescale all trajectories to be collision-free and can then perform standard backtracking to find a decrease in the objective. In our 2D example, we can see that when we scale by the earliest time of impact, the trajectory does not skip over the barrier. Let's now take a look at the numerical accuracy of this method. To do so, we can evaluate the KKD conditions for inequality constraint optimization. The first condition is primal feasibility. In this case, we're looking at interpenetration free configurations. The second is dual feasibility, which requires the contact forces only push and do not pull. Third is stationarity, which in this case is a momentum balance. And last is complementarity slackness, which is that contact forces only apply between touching regions. Primal feasibility is satisfied by construction, as we avoid interpenetration through the use of a CCD-aware line search. Dual feasibility is also satisfied by construction of our barrier function. Stationarity is controlled by the accuracy of our Newton tolerance, epsilon. And last, complementarity slackness is controlled by the barrier clamping threshold, d hat. Up to this point, we've only looked at frictionless contact. Now let's see how IBC models friction. Friction forces are defined by the maximum dissipation potential written here, where TK is the tangent operator at contact K that allows us to compute the local relative sliding displacement. NK is the normal force magnitude. TK and NK both depend on the positions. This is because as the mesh deforms, the tangential plane changes and the, as the distance decreases, the normal force increases. There exist two problems with integrating these forces directly into the IPC formulation. One, the transition from static to dynamic friction is discontinuous, which harms convergence. And two, these friction forces are not integrable. That is, we cannot define a potential to minimize. Let's try to understand the problem with transitioning from static to dynamic friction. We can start by defining the local relative sliding displacement as T times the global displacement. The friction force can then be written as F equal to negative mu times the normal force magnitude times TK times a small f. In the case of static friction, the little f can take any vector in the 2D unit disk. However, in the case of dynamic friction, f has a fixed value. Here the problem becomes clear. As we transition from static to dynamic friction, there can be a discontinuous change in both the direction and magnitude of the friction force. IPC fixes this by smoothing the transition from static to dynamic. This involves introducing a mollifier 
m, which smoothly transitions from 0 to 1 over an interval of 0 to epsilon v times h. m is defined as a c1 piecewise continuous function and looks like this. The parameter epsilon v controls the smoothness of the approximation to the true discontinuous function. In the end, we get a continuous and smooth friction force. Now let's take a look at the second problem, which is that the friction force is not integrable and we can't define a potential. The problem is that n and t are dependent on q. This prevents us from creating a dissipative potential. The solution is to lag the values of n and t, which gives us a friction force that looks like this. Here, n and t are fixed to their values at the beginning of the time step, or optionally, are We can now define a dissipative potential to model friction and to optimize over. This dissipative potential, d, is equal to mu times the normal force magnitude times the antiderivative of our mollifier. The dissipative potential is related back to our friction force by the relationship f equals the negative grad d. We then add this to our objective term and come to the final IPC formulation. With all these components in place, we can simulate realistic frictional effects. In this example, take a close look at the transition from static to dynamic friction and back. Up until now, we have mainly considered contact where the friction cone is symmetric and does not depend on the relative sliding direction. This is known as isotropic friction. However, in the real world, many surfaces have directional features. For instance, here we see a wood sample that was scanned at the micron scale. The jet colored height map reveals a structure of ridges and grooves. These directional surface features can also be seen in close-up RGB images of wood. And brushed metal is another material that exhibits textual details that are direction dependent. In this section, we will examine some of the approaches for modeling friction that exhibits direction dependence or anisotropy. Let us begin with a quick recap about how friction models are usually described and extend these models to the anisotropic regime. Recall that a friction cone is described using a contact frame, which is defined by the unit contact normal n, and the contact plane is spanned by the tangent vector t and binormal vector b. The isotropic Coulomb friction model is defined by a circular cone that describes all feasible contact forces between a pair of materials. And the slope of the cone is given by a single coefficient of friction called mu. Since the cone is radially symmetric, there is no need to describe its orientation. For a given fixed value of the normal force, denoted by lambda n, we can think of the cone as a 2D circle in the contact plane. This is clear if you visualize the 2D limit surface as shown here. Recall that the frictional uh, forces T, lambda T, are bounded by this limit surface. The cone and the set of valid frictional forces is more formally described using a quadratic inequality. Now let's consider the anisotropic cone where the limit surface of friction forces is not radially symmetric. Again, a local contact frame is used to describe the cone. However, the, the cone now has an elliptical shape, and we need to rewrite our cone equation to reflect this. For the elliptical cone, two parameters are needed, mu t and mu b, each of which describe the shape along each of the tangent and binormal axes. Viewing a cross-section of the anisotropic cone for a fixed value of the normal force, we see that this is simply an ellipse in the contact plane. Next, let us consider how to formally describe the anisotropic cone model. We begin with a slight rewrite of the quadratic, quadratic equation for the isotropic cone. The equation for the elliptical cone, shown here on the right, is written similarly but using both coefficients of friction. Note that the tangent direction is aligned with the major axis of the ellipse and the binormal with the minor axis, although we may just as easily adopt the opposite convention. However, this highlights an important difference compared to isotropic friction models. When using an anisotropic model, an additional challenge is determining the orientation of the contact frame in the world space, 
such that the tangent and binormal directions align with the cone directions. Let's now take a look at a model that was recently proposed by the graphics community for building anisotropic friction cones from structural features at the surface. It's called the matchstick model. This phenomenological model is inspired from the behavior that is observed when surfaces with fibers or ridges slide against each other. For example, consider a block with a distinctive fiber direction as shown here. Placing a block with a similar material below the first block and aligning the ridges, we know that the blocks are free to slide in one direction, but strong resistance is experienced in the orthogonal direction due to interlocking ridges. This demonstrates extreme anisotropy. Now consider the same two blocks, but oriented slightly differently. The blocks will also exhibit anisotropic friction, but which is less extreme. Note as well that the alignment of the friction limit surface, shown here in blue, also changes. Finally, if the blocks are oriented such that the fiber directions are perpendicular, then the frictional resistance in all directions should be the same. Hence, we have the case of isotropic friction. And the core idea of the matchstick model is to build a friction cone on the fly based on these fiber directions. This is done by interpolating between the extreme anisotropic and the isotropic cases. To understand how this is done, consider two bodies A and B that come into contact at a single point. As we have seen earlier in these notes, it is necessary to first construct a contact frame at the point and then build a friction limit surface. We assume that the normal direction has already been determined, typically by collision detection. The next step is thus determining the tangent and binormal directions. However, bodies A and B have fibers on the surface that are locally aligned with the structural direction. Let's call these directions SA and SB respectively. And these structural directions can be stored at the surface as a texture map or possibly procedurally generated using a vector field. With the matchstick model, the average fiber direction is used to define the local tangent vector of the contact plane. And then the binormal vector is simply computed from the tangent and normal vectors. One assumption with this model is that the fibers are always oriented in the direction of least resistance. And so when we build the cone, the friction limit in the tangent direction is always lower or equal to the limit in the binormal direction. Here we visualize the limit surface in the contact plane to demonstrate this idea. But let's now consider how to interpolate between the extreme anisotropic and isotropic models using some matchstick math. To do this, we consider the angle theta between the fiber directions SA and SB. In the case of extreme anisotropy, the structural vectors will be aligned, and so theta is zero. And for the case of isotropy, the structural vectors are perpendicular with a relative orientation of 90 degrees, or pi over two radians. Observe that theta is always between zero and 90 degrees. Therefore, we can rescale the angle to have a value between zero and one, giving us the interpolation parameter d. So now it gives us a way to interpolate between the anisotropic and isotropic cones. We can simply linearly interpolate the coefficients of friction mu in the tangent and binormal directions. Then, given the anisotropic cone and the isotropic cone, the interpolated match to cone is computed as shown here using the interpolation coefficient. Let's next take a look at another approach for computing anisotropic friction. Again, information from the surface of colliding objects is used, but with roughness and geometric details encoded as a texture map. We call this the texture friction model. Specifically with this model, friction is computed based on microfacet and mesofacet information contained in normal textures. Normal maps have long been used in computer graphics as a way to model surface variation and roughness, but without increasing the resolution and complexity of the 3D model. For instance, the geometric variation of a scanned oak surface is shown here using both height and normal textures. Essentially, this is an encoding of changes in the local facet orientations by defining a normal vector that is perpendicular to the mesoscale geometry at the surface. The question now becomes how to use this type of information to construct a friction cone. For this, we turn to the field of tribology which has developed numerous models to approximate the frictional behavior due to surfaces in contact. One such model is based on plowing phenomena, where asparities on each surface act like plow blades that dig into the opposing surface, 
This then creates frictional resistance. This behavior is visualized in the 2D diagram shown here. The friction coefficient due to plowing is then computed as a function of the angle between the mesofacet normal M and the mean surface normal N, with larger angles producing more friction. The 2D model presented on the previous slide considers plowing forces generated in only one direction. However, it is clear to see that the amount of friction depends on the direction in which we are pushing. For instance, pushing directly against the plow blade, or in this case the mesofacet, will produce more friction than moving laterally. Thus, the model can be extended by modulating the friction coefficient based on the plowing angle and the direction of pushing. Continuing our analysis of mesofacet behavior, we observe that for a single facet, the behavior can be one-sided. This means that if a microfacet is pushed in a direction opposite its orientation, then it should not contribute to the friction. Any experienced friction will be due to the facet on the opposite side of the asperity. This is visualized here in the toy example. We can therefore extend the plowing model to account for this asymmetry by considering only plowing directions that are oriented in the direction of plowing. Finally, we can compute a coefficient for a given plowing direction d hat by combining contributions from each surface a and b. This gives us the final form for our texture friction model. However, the goal of the texture friction model is to compute friction using rich geometric surface detail. Therefore, the per facet model we have just presented must be evaluated over areas or patches of colliding surfaces. This is done by rendering the geometry and texture surrounding each contact point, and an efficient way to do this is by using the GPU rendering pipeline. Thus, starting from a contact point, a thin viewing volume is constructed around the contact point with axes that are aligned with the contact frame. Then, the geometry with normal textures is rendered into a frame buffer. The plowing model is then evaluated using a special shader program for each fragment. This generates a friction coefficient image for each surface that gives the directional coefficient a friction for a particular sliding direction. For instance, in the example shown here, a cube with a rough texture collides with a plane with a ridge texture. We evaluate the friction coefficients in each of the tangent and binomial directions in both the positive and negative directions for these vectors. This gives us four coefficient images per surface. The aggregate friction coefficient may then be computed by averaging over each coefficient image and combining the averages from each surface. This is done for each direction that was sampled. And for instance, a box cone is easily reconstructed by computing coefficients for the positive and negative tangent and binomial directions. Then, when we solve for frictional impulses, the cone limits can be easily imposed by a projection scheme, such as with the PGS algorithm. And in a nutshell, that is the texture friction model. In summary, we have seen how anisotropic friction may be modeled by an elliptical cone, which depends on the direction of sliding. Furthermore, two approaches for computing anisotropic cones from structural and geometric details on the surface have been presented, the so-called matchstick and texture friction models. Other approaches for modeling anisotropy are presented in the course notes, along with algorithmic details about solving for frictional forces using the nonlinear anisotropic cone and the proximal operator method.